Preface of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book One. Digitized ebook, courtesy of the Posner Collection, at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book One. Preface. The following sheets contain the substance of a course of lectures on the laws of England, which were read by the author in the University of Oxford. His original plan took its rise in the year 1753, and, notwithstanding the novelty of such an attempt in this age and country, and the prejudices usually conceived against any innovations in the established mode of education, he had the satisfaction to find, and he acknowledges it with a mixture of pride and gratitude, that his endeavors were encouraged and patronized by those, both in the university and out of it, whose good opinion and esteem he was principally desirous to obtain. The death of Mr. Viner in 1756, and his ample benefaction to the university for promoting the study of the law, produced about two years afterwards a regular and public establishment of what the author had privately undertaken. The knowledge of our laws and constitution was adopted as a liberal science by general academical authority. Competent endowments were decreed for the support of a lecturer and the perpetual encouragement of students, and the compiler of the ensuing commentaries had the honor to be elected the first Vinerian professor. In this situation he was led, both by duty and inclination, to investigate the elements of the laws, and the grounds of our civil policy, with greater assiduity and attention than many have thought it necessary to do. And yet, all who of late years have attended the public administration of justice must be sensible that a masterly acquaintance with the general spirit of laws and the principles of universal jurisprudence combined with an accurate knowledge of our own municipal constitutions, the original reasons and history, hath given a beauty and energy to many modern judicial decisions, with which our ancestors were wholly unacquainted. If, in the pursuit of these inquiries, the author had been able to rectify any errors which either himself or others may have heretofore imbibed, his pains will be sufficiently answered and, if in some points he is still mistaken, the candid and judicious reader will make due allowances for the difficulties of a search so new, so extensive, and so laborious. The labor, indeed, of these researches, and of a regular attention to his duty, for a series of so many years, he had found inconsistent with his health, as well as his other avocations and had therefore desired the university's permission to retire from his office, after the conclusion of the annual course in which he is at present engaged. But the hints which he had collected for the use of his pupils have been thought by some of his more experienced friends not wholly unworthy of the public eye. It is therefore with a less reluctance that he now commits them to the press, though probably the little degree of reputation which their author may have acquired by the candor of an audience, a test widely different from that of a deliberate perusal, would have been better consulted by a total suppression of his lectures, had that been a matter entirely within his power. For the truth is that the present publication is as much the effect of necessity as it is of choice. The notes which were taken by his hearers have by some of them too partial in his favor, been thought worth of revising and transcribing, and these transcripts have been frequently lent to others. Hence copies have been multiplied, in their nature imperfect, if not erroneous, some of which have fallen into mercenary hands and become the object of clandestine sale. Having therefore so much reason to apprehend a surreptitious impression, he chose rather to submit his own errors to the world, than to seem answerable for those of other men. And, with this apology, he commits himself to the indulgence of the public. End of Preface
Part One of Section One of Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton, Book One, Introduction, Section One. On the Study of the Law, Part One. Mr. Vice-Chancellor and Gentlemen of the University, the general expectation of so numerous and respectable an audience, the novelty, and, I may add, the importance of the duty required from this chair, must unavoidably be productive of great diffidence and apprehensions in him who has the honor to be placed in it. He must be sensible how much will depend upon his conduct in the infancy of a study which is now first adopted by public academical authority, which has generally been reputed, however unjustly, of a dry and unfruitful nature, and of which the theoretical, elementary parts have hitherto received a very moderate share of cultivation. He cannot but reflect that, if either his plan of instruction be crude and injudicious, or the execution of it lame and superficial, it will cast a damp upon the further progress of this most useful and most rational branch of learning, and may defeat for a time the public-spirited design of our wise and munificent benefactor. And this he must more especially dread, when he feels, by experience, how unequal his abilities are, unassisted by preceding examples, to complete, in the manner he could wish, so extensive and arduous a task, since he freely confesses that his former more private attempts have fallen very short of his own ideas of perfection. And yet the candor he has already experienced, and this last transcendent mark of regard, his present nomination by the free and ununanimous suffrage of a great and learned university, an honor to be ever remembered with the deepest and most affectionate gratitude, these testimonies of your public judgment must entirely supersede his own, and forbid him to believe himself totally insufficient for the labor, at least, of this employment. One thing he will venture to hope for, and it certainly shall be his constant aim, by diligence and attention to atone for his other defects, esteeming that the best return which he can possibly make for your favorable opinion of his capacity will be his unwearied endeavors in some little degree to deserve it. The science thus committed to his charge, to be cultivated, methodized, and explained in a course of academical lectures, is that of the laws and constitution of our own country, a species of knowledge in which the gentlemen of England have been more remarkably deficient than those of all Europe besides. In most of the nations on the continent, where the civil or imperial law under different modifications is closely interwoven with the municipal laws of the land, no gentleman, or at least no scholar, thinks his education is complete till he has attended a course or two of lectures, both upon the institutes of Justinian and the local constitutions of his native soil, under the very eminent professors that abound in their several universities and in the northern parts of our own island, where also the municipal laws are frequently connected with the civil, it is difficult to meet with a person of liberal education who is destitute of a competent knowledge in that science, which is to be the guardian of his natural rights and the rule of his civil conduct. Nor have the imperial laws been totally neglected, even in the English nation. A general acquaintance with their decisions has ever been deservedly considered as no small accomplishment of a gentleman, and a fashion has prevailed, especially of late, to transport the growing hopes of this island to foreign universities, in Switzerland, Germany, and Holland, which, though infinitely inferior to our own in every other consideration, have been looked upon as better nurseries of the civil, or, which is nearly the same, of their own municipal law. In the meantime, it has been the peculiar lot of our admirable system of laws to be neglected, and even unknown, by all but one practical profession, 
though built upon the soundest foundations, and approved by the experience of ages. Far be it from me to derogate from the study of the civil law, considered, apart from any binding authority, as a collection of written reason. No man is more thoroughly persuaded of the general excellence of its rules, and the usual equity of its decisions, nor is better convinced of its use as well as ornament to the scholar, the divine, the statesman, and even the common lawyer. But we must not carry our veneration so far as to sacrifice our Alfred and Edward to the manes of Theodosius and Justinian. We must not prefer the edict of the praetor, or the rescripts of the Roman emperor, to our own immemorial customs, or the sanctions of an English parliament, unless we can also prefer the despotic monarchy of Rome and Byzantium, for whose meridians the former were calculated, to the free constitution of Britain, which the latter are adapted to perpetuate. Without detracting, therefore, from the real merit which abounds in the imperial law, I hope I may have leave to assert that if an Englishman must be ignorant of either the one or the other, he had better be a stranger to the Roman than the English institutions. For I think it an undeniable position that a competent knowledge of the laws of that society in which we live is the proper accomplishment of every gentleman and scholar, and highly useful, I had almost said essential, part of liberal and polite education. And in this I am warranted by the example of ancient Rome, where, as Cicero informs us, the very boys were obliged to learn the twelve tables by heart, as a carmen necessarium, or indispensable lesson, to imprint on their tender minds an early knowledge of the laws and constitutions of their country. But, as the long and universal neglect of this study, with us in England, seems in some degree to call in question the truth of this evident position, it shall therefore be the business of this introductory discourse, in the first place, to demonstrate the utility of some general acquaintance with the municipal law of the land, by pointing out its particular uses in all considerable situations of life. Some conjectures will then be offered with regard to the causes of neglecting this useful study, to which will be subjoined a few reflections on the peculiar propriety of reviving it in our own universities. And, first, to demonstrate the utility of some acquaintance with the laws of the land, let us only reflect a moment on the singular frame and policy of that land, which is governed by this system of laws. A land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. This liberty, rightly understood, consists in the power of doing whatever the law permits. Footnote Facultas eut, quod quique facere libet, nisi quid vi, aut iure probibetur. End footnote Which is only to be effected by a general conformity of all orders and degrees to those equitable rules of action, by which the meanest individual is protected from the insults and oppression of the greatest. As therefore every subject is interested in the preservation of the laws, it is incumbent upon every man to be acquainted with those, at least, with which he is immediately concerned, lest he incur the censure as well as inconvenience of living in society without knowing the obligations which it lays him under, and thus much may suffice for persons of inferior condition, who have neither time nor capacity to enlarge their views beyond that contracted sphere in which they are appointed to move, but those on whom nature and fortune have bestowed more abilities and greater leisure cannot be so easily excused. These advantages are given them, not for the benefit of themselves only, but also of the public. And yet they cannot, in any scene of life, discharge properly their duty, either to the public or themselves, without some degree of knowledge in the laws. To evince this the more clearly, it may not be amiss to descend to a few particulars. Let us therefore begin with our gentlemen of independent estates and fortune, the most useful as well as considerable body of men in the nation, whom even to suppose ignorant in this branch of learning 
is treated by Mr. Locke as a strange absurdity. It is their landed property, with its long and voluminous train of descents and conveniences, settlements, entails, and encumbrances that forms the most intricate and most extensive object of legal knowledge. The thorough comprehension of these, in all their minute distinctions, is perhaps too laborious a talk for any but a lawyer of profession. Yet, still the understanding of a few leading principles relating to estates and conveniencing may form some check and guard upon a gentleman's inferior agents, and preserve him at least from very gross and notorious imposition. Again, the policy of all laws has made some forms necessary in the wording of last wills and testaments, and more with regard to their attestation, An ignorance of these must always be of dangerous consequence, to such as by choice or necessity compile their own testaments without any technical assistance. Those who have attended the courts of justice are the best witnesses of the constitution and distresses that are hereby occasioned in families, and of the difficulties that arise in discerning the true meaning of the testator, or sometimes in discovering any meaning at all, so that in the end his estate may often be vested quite contrary to these his enigmatical intentions, because perhaps he has omitted one or two formal words which are necessary to ascertain the sense with indisputable legal precision, or has executed his will in the presence of fewer witnesses than the law requires. But, to proceed from private concerns to those of a more public consideration, all gentlemen of fortune are, in consequence of their property, liable to be called upon to establish the rights, to estimate the injuries, to weigh the accusations, and sometimes to dispose of the lives of their fellow subjects, by serving upon juries. In this situation they are frequently to decide, and that, upon their oaths, questions of nice importance, in the solution of which some legal skill is requisite, especially where the laws and the fact, as it often happens, are intimately blended together, and the general incapacity, even of our best juries, to do this with any tolerable propriety, has greatly debased their authority and has unavoidably thrown more power into the hands of the judges to direct, control, and even reverse their verdicts than perhaps the Constitution intended. But it is not as a juror only that the English gentleman is called upon to determine the questions of right and distribute justice to his fellow subject. It is principally with this order of men that the commission of the peace is filled. And here, a very ample field is opened for a gentleman to exert his talents by maintaining good order in his neighborhood, by punishing the dissolute and idle, by protecting the peaceable and industrious, and, above all, by healing petty differences and preventing vexatious prosecutions. But, in order to attain these desirable ends, it is necessary that the magistrate should understand his business and have not only the will, but the power also, under which must be included the knowledge of administering legal and effectual justice. Else, when he has mistaken his authority through passion, through ignorance, or absurdity, he will be the object of contempt from his inferiors, and of censure from those to whom he is accountable for his conduct. Yet further, most gentlemen of considerable property, at some period or other in their lives, are ambitious of representing their country in Parliament, and those who are ambitious of receiving so high a trust would also do well to remember its nature and importance. They are not thus honorably distinguished from the rest of their fellow subject, merely that they may privilege their persons, their estates, or their domestics that they may list under party banners, may grant or withhold supplies, may vote with or vote against a popular or unpopular administration, but upon considerations far more interesting and important. They are the guardians of the English Constitution, the makers, repealers, and interpreters of the English laws, delegated to watch, to check, 
and to avert every dangerous innovation, to propose, to adopt, and to cherish any solid and well-weighted improvement. Bound by every tie of nature, of honor, and of religion, to transmit that constitution and those laws to their posterity, amended if possible, at least without any derogation. And how unbecoming must it appear in a member of the legislature to vote for a new law, who is utterly ignorant of the old? What kind of interpretation can he be enabled to give, who is a stranger to the text upon which he comments? Indeed, it is really amazing that there should be no other state of life, no other occupation, art, or science, in which some method of instruction is not looked upon as requisite, except only the science of legislation. The noblest and most difficult of any apprenticeships are held necessary to almost every art, commercial or mechanical. A long course of reading and study must form the divine, the physician, and the practical professor of the laws. But every man of superior fortune thinks himself born a legislator. Yet Tully was of a different opinion. It is necessary, says he, for a senator to be thoroughly acquainted with the Constitution, and this, he declares, is a knowledge of the most extensive nature, a matter of science, of diligence, of reflections, without which no senator can possibly be fit for his office. The mischiefs that have arisen to the public from inconsiderate alterations in our laws are too obvious to be called in question, and how far they have been owing to the defective education of our senators is a point well worthy the public attention. The common law of England has fared like other venerable edifices of antiquity, which rash and unexperienced workmen have ventured to new dress and refine, with all the rage of modern improvement. Hence frequently its symmetry has been destroyed, its proportions distorted, and its majestic simplicity exchanged for specious embellishments and fantastic novelties. For, to say the truth, almost all the perplexed questions, almost all the niceties, the intricacies, and delays, which have sometimes disgraced the English, as well as other, courts of justice, owe oh, their original, not to the common law itself, but to innovations that have been made in it, by acts of Parliament, overladen, as Sir Edward Cook expresses it, with provisions and additions, and many times on a sudden, penned or corrected by men of none or very little judgment in law. This great and well-experienced judge declares that in all his time he never knew two questions made upon rights merely depending upon the common law, and warmly laments the confusion introduced by ill-judging and unlearned legislators. But if, he subjoins, acts of Parliament were, after the old-fashioned pained, by such only as perfectly knew what the common law was before the making of any act of Parliament concerning that matter, as also how far forth former statutes have provided remedy for former mischiefs and effects discovered by experience, then should very few questions in law arise, and the learned should not so often and so much perplex their heads to make atonement and peace by construction of law between insensible and disagreeing words, sentences, and provisos, as they now do. And if this inconvenience was so heavily felt in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, you may judge how the evil is increased in later times, when the statute book is swelled to ten times a larger bulk, unless it should be found that the penners of our modern statutes have proportionally better informed themselves in the knowledge of the common law. What is said of our gentlemen in general, and the propriety of their application to the study of the laws of their country, will hold equally strong, or still stronger, with regard to the nobility of this realm, except only in the article of serving upon juries. But, instead of these, they have several peculiar provinces of far greater consequence and concern, being, not only by birth, hereditary consulars of the crown, and judges upon their honor of the lives of their brother peers, but also arbiters of the property of all their fellow-subjects, and that, in the last resort, 
In this, their judicial capacity, they are bound to decide the nicest and most critical points of the law, to examine and correct such errors as have escaped the most experienced sages of the profession, the Lord Keeper and the judges of the courts at Westminster. Their sentence is final, decisive, irrevocable. No appeal, no correction, not even a review can be had. And to their determination, whatever it be, the inferior courts of justice must conform, otherwise the rule of property would no longer be uniform and steady. Should a judge in the most subordinate jurisdiction be deficient in the knowledge of the law, it would reflect infinite contempt upon himself and disgrace upon those who employ him. And yet, the consequence of his ignorance is comparatively very trifling and small. His judgment may be examined, and his errors rectified by other courts. But how much more serious and affecting is the case of a superior judge, if, without any skill in the laws, he will boldly venture to decide a question upon which the welfare and subsistence of whole families may depend, where the chance of his judging right or wrong is barely equal, and where, if he chances to judge wrong, he does an injury of the most alarming nature, an injury without possibility of redress. Yet, vast as this trust is, it can nowhere be so properly resposed as in the noble hands where our excellent constitution has placed it, and therefore placed it, because, from the independence of their fortune and the dignity of their station, they are presumed to employ that leisure which is the consequence of both, in attaining a more extensive knowledge of the laws than persons of inferior rank, and because the founders of our policy relied upon that delicacy of sentiment, so peculiar to noble birth, which, as on the one hand it will prevent either interest or affection from interfering in questions of right, so on the other it will bind a peer in honor, an obligation which the law esteems equal to another's oath, to be master of those points upon which it is his birthright to decide. End of Part 1 of Section 1 of the Introduction Part 2 of Section 1 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book 1. Introduction. Section 1. Part 2. The Roman Pandex will furnish us with a piece of history not unapplicable to our present purpose. Servius Sulpicius, a gentleman of the patrician order and a celebrated orator, had occasion to take the opinion of Quintus Mutius Scaevola, the oracle of the Roman law. But for want of some knowledge in that science, could not so much as understand even the technical terms which his friend was obliged to make use of upon which Mutius Scaevola could not forbear to upbraid him with this memorable reproof, that it was a shame for a patrician, a nobleman, and an orator of causes, to be ignorant of that law in which he was so peculiarly concerned. This reproach made so deep an impression on Sulpicius that he immediately applied himself to the study of the law, wherein he arrived to that proficiency, that he left behind him about a hundred and fourscore volumes of his own compiling upon the subject, and became, in the opinion of Cicero, a much more complete lawyer than even Mutius Scaevola himself. I would not be thought to recommend to our English nobility and gentry to become as great lawyers as Sulpicius, though he, together with his character, sustained likewise that of an excellent orator a firm patriot, and a wise, indefatigable senator. But the inference which arises from this story is this, that ignorance of the law of the land hath ever been esteemed dishonorable, 
and those who are entrusted by their country to maintain, to administer, and to amend them. But surely there is little occasion to enforce this argument any further to persons of rank and distinction, if we of this place may be allowed to form a general judgment from those who are under our inspection. Happy that while we lay down the rule, we can also produce the example. You will therefore permit your professor to indulge both a public and private satisfaction by bearing this open testimony, that in the infancy of these studies among us they were favored with the most diligent attendance and pursued with the most unwearied application by those of the noblest birth and most ample patrimony, some of whom are still the ornaments of the seat of learning, and others at a greater distance continue doing honor to its institutions by comparing our policy and laws with those of other kingdoms abroad, or exerting their senatorial abilities in the councils of the nation at home. Nor will some degree of legal knowledge be found in the least superfluous to persons of inferior rank, especially those of the learned professions. The clergy in particular, besides the common obligations they are under in proportion to their rank and fortune, have also abundant reason, considered merely as clergymen, to be acquainted with many branches of the law, which are almost peculiar and appropriated to themselves alone. Such are the laws relating to advowsons, institutions, and inductions, to simony and simonical contracts, to uniformity, residence, and pluralities, to tithe and other ecclesiastical dues, to marriages, more especially of late, and to a variety of other subjects, which are consigned to the care of their order by the provisions of particular statutes. To understand these are right, to discern what is warranted or enjoined, and what is forbidden by law, demands a sort of legal apprehension, which is no otherwise to be acquired than by use and a familiar acquaintance with legal writers. For the gentlemen of the faculty of physic, I must frankly own, that I see no special reason why they in particular should apply themselves to the study of the law, unless in common with other gentlemen, and to complete the character of general and extensive knowledge, a character which their profession, beyond others, has remarkably deserved. They will give me leave, however, to suggest, and that not ludicrously, that it might frequently be of use to families upon sudden emergencies, if the physician were acquainted with the doctrine of last wills and testaments, at least so far as relates to the formal part of their execution. But those gentlemen who intend to process the civil and ecclesiastical laws in the spiritual and maritime courts of this kingdom are, of all men, next to the common lawyers, the most indispensably obliged to apply themselves seriously to the study of our municipal laws. For the civil and canon laws, considered with respect to any intrinsic obligation, have no force or authority in this kingdom. They are no more binding in England than our laws are binding at Rome. But as far as these foreign laws, on account of some peculiar propriety, have in some particular cases, and in some particular courts, been introduced and allowed by our laws, so far they oblige, and no farther their authority being wholly founded upon that permission and adoption, in which we are no singular in our notions. For even in Holland, where the imperial law is much cultivated and its decisions pretty generally followed, we are informed by Van Leuven that it receives its force from customs and the consent of the people, either tacitly or expressly given. For otherwise, he adds, we should no more be bound by this law than by that of the Almains, the Franks, the Saxons, the Goths, the Vandals, and other of the ancient nations. Wherefore, in all points in which the different systems depart from each other, the law of the land takes place of the law of Rome, whether ancient or modern, imperial or pontifical. 
and in those of our English courts wherein a reception has been allowed to the civil and canon laws, if either they exceed the bounds of that reception, by extending themselves to other matters, than are permitted to them, or, if such courts proceed according to the decisions of those laws, in cases wherein it is controlled by the law of the land, the common law in either instance both may, and frequently does, prohibit and annul their proceedings, and it will not be a sufficient excuse for them to tell the king's courts at Westminster that their practice is warranted by the law of Justinian or Gregory, or is conformable to the decrees of the rota or imperial chamber, for which reason it becomes highly necessary for every civilian and canonist that would act with safety as a judge, or with prudence and reputation as an advocate, to know in what cases and how far the English laws have given sanction to the Roman, in what points the latter are rejected, and where they are both so intermixed and blended together as to form certain supplemental parts of the common law of England, distinguished by the titles of the king's maritime, the king's military, and the king's ecclesiastical law. The propriety of which inquiry the University of Oxford has for more than a century so thoroughly seen that in her statutes she appoints that one of the three questions to be annually discussed at the act by the jurist and sceptres shall relate to the common law, subjoining this reason, quia juris civilis studiosos, decet baud in peritus esse, juris municipalis, e differentias exteri patriique juris notas habere. And the statutes of the University of Cambridge speak expressly to the same effect. From the general use and necessity of some acquaintance with the common law, the inference were extremely easy with regard to the propriety of the present institution, in the place to which gentlemen of all ranks and degrees refort, as the fountain of all useful knowledge. But how it has come to pass that a design of this sort has never before taken place in the university, and the reason why the study of our laws has in general fallen into disuse, I shall previously proceed to inquire. Sir John Fortescue, in his panegyric on the laws of England, which was written in the reign of Henry the Sixth, puts a very obvious question in the mouth of the young prince, whom he is exhorting to apply himself to that branch of learning. Why the laws of England, being so good, so fruitful, and so commodious, are not taught in the universities, as the civil laws and canon laws are? In answer to which he gives, what seems, with due difference be it spoken, a very jejune and unsatisfactory reason, being, in short, that, as the proceedings at common law were in his time carried on three different tongues, the English, the Latin, and the French, that science must be necessarily taught in those three several languages, but that in the universities all sciences were taught in the Latin tongue only, and therefore he concludes that they could not be conveniently taught or studied in our universities. But, without attempting to examine seriously the validity of this reason, the very shadow of which, by the wisdom of your late constitutions, is entirely taken away, we perhaps may find out a better, or at least a more plausible account, why the study of the municipal laws has been banished from these seats of science, that what the learned Chancellor thought it prudent to give to his royal pupil, that ancient collection of unwritten maxims and customs, which is called the common law, however compounded or from whatever fountains derived, has subsisted immemorially in this kingdom, and, though somewhat altered and impaired by the violence of the times, had in great measure weathered the rude shock of the Norman conquest. This had endeared it to the people in general, as well because its decisions were universally known, as because it was found to be excellently adapted to the genius of the English nation. In the knowledge of this law consisted great part of the learning of those dark ages. It was then taught, says Mr. Selden, in the monasteries, in the universities, 
and in the families of the principal nobility. The clergy in particular, as they then engrossed almost every other branch of learning, so, like the predecessors the British Druids, they were peculiarly remarkable for their proficiency in the study of the law. Nullus clericus nisi calcidicus is the character given of them soon after the conquest by William of Malmesbury. The judges, therefore, were usually created out of the sacred order, as was likewise the case among the Normans, and all the inferior offices were supplied by the lower clergy, which has occasioned their successors to be denominated clerks to this day. But the common law of England, being not committed to writing, but only handed down by tradition, use, and experience, was not so heartily relished by the foreign clergy, who came over hither in shoals during the reign of the conqueror and his two sons, and were utter strangers to our constitutions as well as our language. And an accident, which soon after happened, had nearly completed its ruin. A copy of Justinian's Pandex, being newly discovered at Amalfi, soon brought the civil law into vogue all over the west of Europe, where before it was quite laid aside and in a manner forgotten, though some traces of its authority remained in Italy and in the eastern provinces of the empire. This now became in a particular manner the favorite of the popish clergy, who borrowed the method and many of the maxims of their canon law from the original. The study of it was introduced into several universities abroad, particularly that of Bologna, where exercises were performed, lectures read, and degrees conferred in this faculty, as in other branches of science. And many nations on the continent, just then beginning to recover from the convulsions consequent upon the overthrow of the Roman Empire, and settling by degrees into peaceable forms of government, adopted the civil law, being the best written system then extant, as the basis of their several constitutions, lending and interweaving it among their own feudal customs, in some places with a more extensive, in others a more confined authority. Nor was it long before the prevailing mode of the times reached England. For Theobald, a Norman abbot, being elected to the see of Canterbury, and extremely addicted to this new study, brought over with him in his retinue many learned proficients therein, and among the rest Roger surnamed Vacarius, whom he placed in the University of Oxford, to teach it to the people of this country. But it did not meet with the same easy reception in England, where a mild and rational system of laws had been long established, as it did upon the continent. And, though the monkish clergy, devoted to the will of a foreign primate, received it with eagerness and zeal, yet the laity, who were more interested to preserve the old constitution, and had already severely felt the effect of many Norman innovations, continued wedded to the use of the common law. King Stephen immediately published a proclamation forbidding the study of the laws, then newly imported from Italy, which was treated by the monks as a piece of impiety, and, though it might prevent the introduction of the civil law process into our courts of justice, yet did not hinder the clergy from reading and teaching it in their own schools and monasteries. From this time the nation seems to have been divided into two parties, the bishops and clergy, many of them foreigners, who applied themselves wholly to the study of the civil and canon laws, which now came to be inseparably interwoven with each other, and the nobility and laity, who adhered with equal pertinacity to the old common law, both of them reciprocally jealous of what they were unacquainted with and neither of them perhaps allowing the opposite system that real merit which is abundantly to be found in each. This appears on the one hand from the spleen with which the monastic writers speak of our municipal laws upon all occasions, and, on the other, from the firm temper which the nobility showed at the famous Parliament of Merton, when the prelate endeavoured to procure an act 
to declare all bastards legitimate in case the parents intermarried at any time afterwards, alleging this only reason, because Holy Church, that is, the canon law, declared such children legitimate. But all the earls and barons, says the parliament roll, with one voice answered that they would not change the laws of England, which had hitherto been used and approved. And we find the same jealousy prevailing above a century afterwards, when the nobility declared with a kind of prophetic spirit that the realm of England hath never been unto this hour, neither by consent of our lord the king and the lords of parliament shall it ever be, ruled or governed by the civil law. And of this temper between the clergy and laity, many more instances might be given. While things were in this situation, the clergy, finding it impossible to root out the municipal law, began to withdraw themselves by degrees from the temporal courts, and to that end, very early in the reign of King Henry the Third, episcopal constitutions were published, forbidding all ecclesiastics to appear as advocates in foro feculari, nor did they long continue to act as judges there, nor caring to take the oath of office which was then found necessary to be administered, that it should in all things determine according to the law and custom of this realm, though they still kept possession of the high office of Chancellor, an office then of little judicial power, and afterwards, as its business increased by degrees, they modelled the process of the court at their own discretion. But whenever they retired, and whenever their authority extended, they carried with them the same zeal to introduce the rules of the civil in exclusion of the municipal law. This appears in particular manner from the spiritual courts of all denominations, from the chancellor's courts in both our universities, and from the high court of chancery before mentioned, in all of which the proceedings are to this day in a course much conformed to the civil law, for which no tolerable reason can be assigned, unless that these courts were all under the immediate direction of the popish ecclesiastics, among whom it was a point of religion to exclude the municipal law. Pope Innocent the Fourth, having forbidden the very reading of it by the clergy, because its decisions were not founded on the imperial constitutions, but merely on the customs of the laity. And if it be considered that our universities began about that period to receive their present form of scholastic discipline, that they were then, and continued to be, till the time of the Reformation, entirely under the influence of the popish clergy, Sir John Mason, the first Protestant, being also the first lay, Chancellor of Oxford. This will lead us to perceive the reason why the study of the Roman laws was in those days of bigotry, pursued with such alacrity in these seats of learning, and why the common law was entirely despised, and esteemed little better than heretical. And, since the Reformation, many causes have conspired to prevent its becoming a part of academical education, as, first, long usage and established custom, which, as in everything else, so especially in the forms of scholastic exercise, have justly great weight and authority. Secondly, the great intrinsic merit of the civil law, considered upon the footing of reason and not of obligation, which was well known to the instructors of our youth, and their total ignorance of the merit of the common law, though its equal at least, and perhaps an improvement on the other. But the principal reason of all that has hindered the introduction of this branch of learning is that the study of the common law, being banished from hence in the times of popery, had fallen into a quite different channel, and has hitherto been wholly cultivated in another place. But, as this long usage and established custom of ignorance in the laws of the land begin now to be thought unreasonable, and as by this means the merit of those laws will probably be more generally known, we may hope that the method of studying them will soon revert to its ancient cause, and the foundations, at least, of that science will be laid in the two universities, without being exclusively confined to the channel 
which it fell into at the times I have been just describing. For, being then entirely abandoned by the clergy, a few stragglers accepted, the study and practice of it devolved, of course, into the hands of laymen, who entertained upon their parts a most hearty aversion to the civil law, and made no scruple to profess their contempt, nay, even their ignorance of it, in the most public manner. But still, as the balance of learning was greatly on the side of the clergy, and as the common law was no longer taught, as formerly, in any part of the kingdom, it must have been subjected to many inconveniences, and perhaps would have been gradually lost and overrun by the civil, a suspicion well justified from the frequent transcripts of Justinian to be met with in Bracton and Flitta, had it not been for a particular incident which happened at a very critical time, and contributed greatly to its support. End of Part 2 of Section 1 of the Introduction Section 3 Part 3 of Section 1 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone, Book 1. Introduction, Section 1, Part 3. The incident, I mean, was the fixing the Court of Common Pleas, the Grand Tribunal for Disputes of Property, to be held in one certain spot that the seat of ordinary justice might be permanent and notorious to all the nation. Formerly that, in conjunction with all the other superior courts, was held before the King's capital justiciary of England in the Orla Regis, or such of his palaces wherein his royal person resided, and removed with his household from one end of the kingdom to the other. This was found to occasion great inconvenience to the suitors, to remedy which it was made an article of the Great Charter of Liberties, both that of King John and King Henry the Third, that common pleas should no longer follow the King's court, but be held in some certain place. In consequence of which they have ever since been held, a few necessary removals in times of the plague excepted, in the palace of Westminster only. This brought together the professors of the municipal law, who before were dispersed about the kingdom, and formed them into an aggregate body, whereby a society was established of persons who, as Spellman observes, addicting themselves wholly to the study of the laws of the land, and no longer considering it as a mere subordinate science for the amusement of leisure hours, soon raised those laws to that pitch of perfection which they suddenly attained under the auspices of our English Justinian, King Edward I. In consequence of this lucky assemblage, they naturally fell into a kind of collegiate order, and, being excluded from Oxford and Cambridge, found it necessary to establish a new university of their own. This they did by purchasing at various times certain houses, now called the Inns of Court and of Chancery, between the city of Westminster, the place of holding the King's courts, and the city of London, for advantage of ready access to the one, and plenty of provisions in the other. Here exercises were performed, lectures read, and degrees were at length conferred in the common law, as at other universities in the canon and civil. The degrees were those of barristers, first styled apprentices from a prender to learn, who answered to our bachelors, as the state and degree of a sergeant, servientis at legem, did to that of doctor. The crown seems to have soon taken under its protection this infant seminary of common law, and the more effectually to foster and cherish it, 
King Henry III, in the nineteenth year of his reign, issued out an order, directed to the mayor and sheriffs of London, commanding that no regent of any law schools within that city should for the future teach law therein. The word law, or legis, being a general term, may create some doubt at this distance of time whether the teaching of the civil law, or the common, or both, is hereby restrained. But in either case it tends to the same end. If the civil law only is prohibited, which is Mr. Selden's opinion, it is then a retaliation upon the clergy who had excluded the common law from their seats of learning. If the municipal law be also included in the restriction, as Sir Edward Cook understands it, and which the words seem to import, then the intention is evidently this. By preventing private teachers within the walls of the city, to collect all the common lawyers into the one public university which was newly instituted in the suburbs. In this juridical university, for such it is insisted to have been by Fortescue and Sir Edward Cook, there are two sorts of collegiate houses, one called Inns of Chancery, in which the younger students of the law were usually placed, learning and studying, says Fortescue, the originals and, as it were, the elements of the law, who, profiting therein, as they grow to ripeness, so are they admitted into the greater inns of the same study, called the inns of court. And in these inns of both kinds, he goes on to tell us, the knights and barons, with other grandees and noblemen of the realm, did use to place their children, though they did not desire to have them thoroughly learned in the law, or to get their living by its practice, and that in his time there were about two thousand students at these several inns, all of whom he informs us were filii nobilium, or gentlemen born. Hence it is evident that, though under the influence of the monks our universities neglected this study yet, in the time of Henry the Sixth, it was thought highly necessary, and was the universal practice, for the young nobility and gentry to be instructed in the originals and elements of the laws. But by degrees this custom has fallen into disuse, so that in the reign of Queen Elizabeth Sir Edward Cook does not reckon above a thousand students, and the number at present is very considerably less, which seems principally owing to these reasons. First, because the inns of chancery, being now almost totally filled by the inferior branch of the profession, they are neither commodious nor proper for the resort of gentlemen of any rank or figure, so that there are now very rarely any young students entered at the inns of chancery. Secondly, because in the inns of court all sorts of regimen and academical superintendents, either with regard to models or studies, are found impracticable, and therefore entirely neglected. Lastly, because persons of birth and fortune, after having finished their usual courses at the universities, have seldom leisure or resolution sufficient to enter upon a new scheme of study at a new place of instruction. Wherefore few gentlemen now resort to the inns of court, but such for whom the knowledge of practice is absolutely necessary, such, I mean, as are intended for the profession. The rest of our gentry, not to say our nobility also, having usually retired to their estates, or visited foreign kingdoms, or entered upon public life without any instruction in the laws of the land, and indeed with hardly any opportunity of gaining instruction, unless it can be afforded them in these seats of learning and that these are the proper places for affording assistances of this kind to gentlemen of all stations and degrees, cannot, I think, with any colour of reason be denied. For not one of the objections which are made to the inns of court and chancery, and which I have just enumerated, will hold with regard to the universities. Gentlemen may here associate with gentlemen of their own rank and degree, nor are their conduct and studies left entirely to their own discretion, but regulated by a discipline so wise and exact, yet so liberal, so sensible and manly, that their conformity to its rules, 
which does at present so much honour to our youth, is not more the effect of constraint than of their own inclinations and choice. Neither need they apprehend too long an avocation hereby from their private concerns and amusements, or, what is a more noble object, the service of their friends and their country. This study will go hand in hand with their other pursuits. It will obstruct none of them, it will ornament and assist them all. But if, upon the whole, there are any still wedded to monastic prejudice that can entertain a doubt how far this study is properly and regularly academical, such persons, I am afraid, either have not considered the constitution and design of an university, or else think very meanly of it. It must be a deplorable narrowness of mind that would confine these seats of instruction to the limited views of one or two learned professions. To the praise of this age be it spoken, a more open and generous way of thinking begins now universally to prevail. The attainment of liberal and genteel accomplishments, though not of the intellectual sort, has been thought by our wisest and most affectionate patrons, and very lately by the whole university, no small improvement of our ancient plan of education and therefore I may safely affirm that nothing, how unusual soever, is, under due regulations, improper to be taught in this place which is proper for a gentleman to learn. But that a science which distinguishes the criterions of right and wrong, which teaches to establish the one, and prevent, punish, or redress the other, which employs in its theory the noblest faculties of the soul, and exerts in its practice the cardinal virtues of the heart, a science which is universal in its use and extent, accommodated to each individual, yet comprehending the whole community, that a science like this should have ever been deemed unnecessary to be studied in an university, is matter of astonishment and concern. Surely, if it were not before an object of academical knowledge, it was high time to make it one. And to those who can doubt the propriety of its reception among us, if any such there be, we may return an answer in their own way, that ethics are confessedly a branch of academical learning, and Aristotle himself has said, speaking of the laws of his own country, that jurisprudence, or the knowledge of those laws, is the principal and most perfect branch of ethics. From a thorough conviction of this truth, our munificent benefactor, Mr. Viner, having employed above half a century in amassing materials for new modelling and rendering more commodious the rude study of the laws of the land, consigned both the plan and execution of these, his public-spirited designs, to the wisdom of his parent university. Resolving to dedicate his learned labours to the benefit of posterity and the perpetual service of his country, he was sensible he could not perform his resolutions in a better and more effectual manner than by extending to the youth of this place those assistances of which he so well remembered and so heartily regretted the want and the sense which the university has entertained of this ample and most useful benefaction must appear beyond a doubt from their gratitude in receiving it with all possible marks of esteem, from their alacrity and unexampled dispatch in carrying it into execution, and, above all, from the laws and constitutions by which they have effectually guarded it from the neglect and abuse to which such institutions are liable. We have seen an universal emulation, who best should understand or most faithfully pursue the designs of our generous patron, and with pleasure we recollect that those who are most distinguished by their quality, their fortune, their station, their learning, or their experience, have appeared the most zealous to promote the success of Mr. Viner's establishment. End of section 3 Recording by Graham Redman
Section 4 Part 4 of Section 1 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackston. Book One. Introduction. Section One. Part Four. The advantages that might result to the science of the law itself, when a little more attended to in these seats of knowledge, perhaps would be very considerable. The leisure and abilities of the learned in these retirements might either suggest expedients, or execute those dictated by wiser heads, for improving its method, retrenching its superfluities, and reconciling the little contrarieties, which the practice of many centuries will necessarily create in any human system, a task which those who are deeply employed in business and the more active scenes of the profession can hardly condescend to engage in. And as to the interest, or, which is the same, the reputation of the universities themselves, I may venture to pronounce that if ever this study should arrive to any tolerable perfection, either here or at Cambridge, the nobility and gentry of this kingdom would not shorten their residence upon this account, nor perhaps entertain a worse opinion of the benefits of academical education. Neither should it be considered as a matter of light importance, that while we thus extend the pomeria of university learning, and adopt a new tribe of citizens within these philosophical walls, we interest a very numerous and very powerful profession in the preservation of our rights and revenues. For I think it is past dispute that those gentlemen who resort to the inns of court with a view to pursue the profession will find it expedient, whenever it is practicable, to lay the previous foundations of this, as well as every other science, in one of our learned universities. We may appeal to the experience of every sensible lawyer, whether anything can be more hazardous or discouraging than the usual entrance on the study of the law. A raw and unexperienced youth, in the most dangerous season of life, is transplanted on a sudden into the midst of allurements to pleasure, without any restraint or check, but what his own prudence can suggest. With no public direction in what cause to pursue his inquiries, no private assistance to remove the distresses and difficulties which will always embarrass a beginner, in this situation he is expected to sequester himself from the world, and by a tedious lonely process to extract the theory of law from a mass of undigested learning, or else by an assiduous attendant on the courts to pick up theory and practice together, sufficient to qualify him for the ordinary run of business. How little, therefore, is it to be wondered at, that we hear of so frequent miscarriages, that so many gentlemen of bright imaginations grow weary of so unpromising a search, and addict themselves wholly to amusement, or other less innocent pursuits, and that so many persons of moderate capacity confuse themselves at first setting out, and continue ever dark and puzzled during the remainder of their lives. The evident want of some assistance in the rudiments of legal knowledge has given birth to a practice which, if ever it had grown to be general, must have proved of extremely pernicious consequence. I mean the custom, by some so very warmly recommended, to drop all liberal education, as of no use to lawyers, and to place them, in its stead, at the desk of some skilful attorney, in order to initiate them early in all the depths of practice, and render them more dexterous in the mechanical part of business. A few instances of particular persons, 
men of excellent learning and unblemished integrity, who in spite of this method of education, have shown in the foremost ranks of the bar, have afforded some kind of sanction to this illiberal path to the profession, and biased many parents of short-sighted judgment in its favor, not considering that there are some geniuses formed to overcome all disadvantages, and that from such particular instances no general rules can be formed, nor observing that those very persons have frequently recommended by the most forcible of all examples the disposal of their own offspring, a very different foundation of legal studies, a regular academical education. Perhaps, too, in return, I could now direct their eyes to our principal seats of justice, and suggest a few hints in favor of university learning. But in these, all who hear me, I know, have already prevented me. Many, therefore, due allowance for one or two shining exceptions. Experience may teach us to foretell that a lawyer thus educated to the bar, in subservience to attorneys and solicitors, will find he has begun at the wrong end. If practice be the whole he is taught, practice must also be the whole he will ever know, if he be uninstructed in the elements and first principles upon which the rules of practice is founded. The least variation from established precedents will totally distract and bewilder him. Ita lex scripta est is the utmost his knowledge will arrive at. He must never aspire to form, and seldom expect to comprehend, any arguments drawn a priori, from the spirit of the laws and the natural foundations of justice. Nor is this all, for, as few persons of birth or fortune, or even of scholastic education, will submit to the drudgery of servitude and the manual labor of copying the trash of an office, should this infatuation prevail to any considerable degree, we must rarely expect to see a gentleman of distinction or learning at the bar, and what the consequence may be to have the interpretation and enforcement of the laws, which include the entire disposal of our properties, liberties, and lives, fall wholly into the hands of obscure or illiteral men, is matter of very public concern. The inconveniences here pointed out can never be eventually prevented, but by making academical education a previous step to the profession of the common law, and at the same time making the rudiments of the law a part of academical education. For sciences are of a sociable disposition, and flourish best in the neighborhood of each other. Nor is there any branch of learning, but may be helped and improved by assistances drawn from other arts. If therefore the student in our laws hath formed both his sentiments and style, by perusal and imitation of the purest classical writers, among whom the historians and orators will best deserve his regard, if he can reason with precision, and separate argument from fallacy, by the clear simple rules of pure unsophisticated logic, if he can fix his attention, and steadily pursue truth, through any the most intricate deduction, by the use of mathematical demonstrations, if he has enlarged his conceptions of nature and art, by a view of the several branches of genuine experimental philosophy, if he has impressed on his mind the sound maxims of the law of nature, the best and most authentic foundation of human laws, if, lastly, he has contemplated those maxims reduced to a practical system in the laws of imperial Rome, if he has done this, or any part of it, though all may be easily done under as able instructors as ever graced any seats of learning. A student thus qualified may enter upon the study of the law with incredible advantage and reputation, and if, at the conclusion, or during the acquisition of these accomplishments, he will afford himself here a year or two's farther leisure to lay the foundation of his future labors in a solid scientifical method, without thrusting too early to attend that practice 
which it is impossible he should rightly comprehend, he will afterwards proceed with the greatest ease, and will unfold the most intricate points with an intuitive rapidity and clearness. I shall not insist upon such motives as might be drawn from principles of economy, and are applicable to particulars only. I reason upon more general topics, and therefore to the qualities of the head, which I have just enumerated. I cannot but add those of the heart, affectionate loyalty to the king, a zeal for liberty and the constitution, a sense of real honor, and well-grounded principles of religion, as necessary to form a truly valuable English lawyer, a hide, a hale, or a talbot, and, whatever the ignorance of some, or unkindness of others, may have heretofore untruly suggested, experience will warrant us to affirm that these endowments of loyalty and public spirit, of honor and religion, are nowhere to be found in more high perfection than the two universities of this kingdom. Before I conclude, it may perhaps be expected that I lay before you a short and general account of the method I propose to follow in endeavoring to execute the trust you have been pleased to repose in my hands. And in these solemn lectures, which are ordained to be read at the entrance of every term, more perhaps to the public honor of this laudable institution than for the private instruction of individuals, I presume it will best answer the intent of our benefactor and the expectation of this learned body, if I attempt to illustrate at times such detached titles of the law, as are the most easy to be understood, and most capable of historical or critical ornament. But in reading the complete course, which is annually consigned to my care, a more regular method will be necessary, and, till a better is proposed, I shall take the liberty to follow the same that I have already submitted to the public, to fill up and finish that outline with propriety and correctness, and to render the whole intelligible to the uninformed minds of beginners, whom we are too apt to suppose acquaintance with terms and ideas, which they never had opportunity to learn. This must be my ardent endeavor, though by no means my promise to accomplish. You will permit me, however, very briefly to describe, rather, what I conceive an academical expounder of the law should do, than what I have ever known to be done. He should consider his course as a general map of the law, marking out the shape of the country, its connections and boundaries, its greater divisions and principal cities, it is not his business to describe minutely the subordinate limits, or to fix the longitude and latitude of every inconsiderable hamlet. His attention should be engaged, like that of the readers in Fortescue's inns of Chancery, in tracing out the originals, and as it were the elements of the law. For if, as Justinian has observed, the tender understanding of the student can be loaded at the first with a multitude and variety of matter. It will either occasion him to desert his studies, or will carry him heavily through them, with much labor, delay, and despondence. These originals should be traced to their fountains, as well as our distance will permit, to the customs of the Britons and Germans, as recorded by Caesar and Tacitus to the codes of the northern nations on the continent, and, more especially, to those of our own Saxon princes, to the rules of the Roman law, either left here in the days of Papinian, or imported by Vicarius and his followers, but, above all, to that inexhaustible reservoir of legal antiquities and learning, the feudal law, or, as Spellman has entitled it, the law of nations in our western orb. These primary rules and fundamental principles should be weighed and compared with the precepts of the law of nature and the practice of other countries, should be explained by reasons, illustrated by examples, 
and confirmed by undoubted authorities. Their history should be deduced, their changes and revolutions observed, and it should be shown how far they are connected with, or have at any time been affected by, the civil transactions of the kingdom. A plan of this nature, if executed with care and ability, cannot fail of administering a most useful and rational entertainment to students of all ranks and professions. And yet, it must be confessed that the study of the law is not merely a matter of amusement, for, as a very judicious writer has observed, upon a similar occasion, the learner will be considerably disappointed if he looks for entertainment without the expense of attention. An attention, however, no greater than is usually bestowed in mastering the rudiments of other sciences, or sometimes in pursuing a favorite recreation or exercise. And this attention is not equally necessary to be exerted by every student upon every occasion. Some branches of the law, as the formal process of civil suit, and the subtile distinctions incident to landed property, which are the most difficult to be thoroughly understood, are the least worth the pains of understanding, except to such gentlemen as intend to pursue the profession. To others, I may venture to apply, with a slight alteration, the words of Sir John Fortescue, when first his royal pupil determined to engage in this study. It will not be necessary for a gentleman, as such, to examine with a close application the critical niceties of the law. It will fully be sufficient, and he may well enough be denominated a lawyer, if under the instruction of a master he traces up the principles and grounds of the law, even to their original elements. Therefore, in a very short period, and with very little labor, he may be sufficiently informed in the laws of his country, if he will but apply his mind in good earnest to receive and apprehend them. For, though such knowledge as is necessary for a judge is hardly to be acquainted by the lucubrations of twenty years, yet with a genius of tolerable perspicacity, that knowledge which is fit for a person of birth or condition may be learned in a single year, without neglecting his other improvements. To the few, therefore, the very few, I am persuaded, that entertain such unworthy notions of an university, as to suppose it intended for mere dissipation of thought, to such as mean only to while away the awkward interval from childhood to twenty-one, between the restraints of the school and the licentiousness of politer life, in a calm middle state of mental and of moral inactivity, to these Mr. Viner gives no invitation to an entertainment which they never can relish, but to the long and illustrious train of noble and ingenuous youth, who are not more distinguished among us by their birth and possessions than by the regularity of their conduct and their thirst after useful knowledge, to these our benefactor has consecrated the fruits of a long and laborious life, worn out in the duties of his calling, and will joyfully reflect if such reflections can be now the employment of his thoughts, that he could not more effectually have benefited posterity, or contributed to the service of the public, than by founding an institution which may instruct the rising generation in the wisdom of our civil policy, and inform them with a desire to be still better acquainted with the laws and constitution of their country. End of section 4。section 5, part 1 of section 2 of the introduction of the commentaries on the laws of England, book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Kwan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. 
Introduction, Section 2, Part 1 Section the Second Of the Nature of Laws in General Law, in its most general and comprehensive sense, signifies a rule of action, and is applied indiscriminately to all kinds of action, whether animate or inanimate, rational or irrational. Thus we say, the laws of motion, of gravitation, of optics, or mechanics, as well as the laws of nature and of nations. And it is that rule of action which is prescribed by some superior and which the inferior is bound to obey. Thus, when the Supreme Being formed the universe and created matter out of nothing, he impressed certain principles upon that matter, from which it can never depart, and without which it would cease to be. When he put that matter into motion, he established certain laws of motion, to which all movable bodies must conform, and to descend from the greatest operation to the smallest. When a workman forms a clock, or other piece of mechanism, he establishes at his own pleasure certain arbitrary laws for its direction, as that the hand shall describe a given space in a given time, to which law, as long as the work conforms, so long it continues in perfection, and answers the end of its formation. If we further advance from mere inactive matter to vegetable and animal life, we shall find them still governed by laws, more numerous indeed, but equally fixed and invariable. The whole progress of plants, from the seed to the root, and from thence to the seed again, the method of animal nutrition, digestion, secretion, and all other branches of vital economy, are not left to chance or the will of the creature itself, but are performed in a wondrous involuntary manner, and guided by unerring rules laid down by the great Creator. This, then, is the general signification of law, a rule of action dedicated by some superior being, and in those creatures that have neither the power to think nor the will, such laws must be invariably obeyed, so long as the creature itself subsists, for its existence depends upon that obedience. But laws, in their more confined sense, and in which it is our present business to consider them, denote the rules, not of action in general, but of human action or conduct, that is, the precepts by which man, the noblest of all sublunary beings, a creature endowed with both reason and free will, is commanded to make use of those faculties in the general regulation of his behavior. Man, considered as a creature, must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is entirely a dependent being. A being, independent of any other, has no rule to pursue, but such as he prescribes to himself. But a state of dependence will inevitably oblige the inferior to take the will of him, on whom he depends, as the rule of his conduct. Not indeed in every particular, but in all those points wherein his dependence consists. This principle, therefore, has more or less extent, an effect, in proportion as the superiority of the one and the dependence of the other is greater or less, absolute or limited, and consequently, as man depends absolutely upon his Maker for every thing, it is necessary that he should in all points conform to his Maker's will. This will of his Maker is called the law of nature, for as God, when he created matter, and endued it with a principle of mobility, established certain rules for the perpetual direction of that motion. So, when he created man, and endued him with free will to conduct himself in all parts of life, he laid down certain immutable laws of human nature, whereby that free will is in some degree regulated and restrained, 
and gave him also the faculty of reason to discover the purport of those laws. Considering the Creator only as a being of infinite power, he was able unquestionably to have prescribed whatever laws he pleased to his creature, man, however unjust or severe. But, as he is also a being of infinite wisdom, he has laid down only such laws as were founded in those relations of justice that existed in the nature of things antecedent to any positive precept. These are the eternal, immutable laws of good and evil, to which the Creator Himself in all His dispensations conforms, and which He has enabled human reason to discover, so far as they are necessary for the conduct of human actions. Such, among others, are these principles, that we should live honestly, should hurt nobody, and should render to every one its due, to which three general precepts Justinian has reduced the whole doctrine of law. But if the discovery of these first principles of the law of nature depended only upon the due exertion of right reason, and could not otherwise be attained than by a chain of metaphysical disquisitions, mankind would have wanted some inducement to have quickened their inquiries, and the greater part of the world would have rested content in mental indolence, and ignorance its inseparable companion. As therefore the Creator is a being, not only of infinite power and wisdom, but also of infinite goodness, he has been pleased to contrive the constitution and frame of humanity, that we should want no other prompter to inquire after and pursue the rule of right, but only our own self-love, that universal principle of action. For he has so intimately connected, so inseparably interwoven, the laws of eternal justice with the happiness of each individual, that the latter cannot be attained but by observing the former, and, if the former be punctually obeyed, it cannot but induce the latter, in consequence of which mutual connection of justice and human felicity, he has not perplexed the law of nature with a multitude of abstracted rules and precepts, referring merely to the fitness or unfitness of things, as some have vainly surmised but has graciously reduced the rule of obedience to this one paternal precept, that man should pursue his own happiness. This is the foundation of what we call ethics, or natural law, for the several articles into which it is branched in our own systems amount to no more than demonstrating that this or that action tends to a man's real happiness, and therefore very justly concluding that the performance of it is a part of the law of nature, or, on the other hand, that this or that action is destructive of man's real happiness, and therefore that the law of nature forbids. This law of nature, being coeval with mankind and dedicated by God himself, is of course superior in obligation to any other. It is binding all over the globe, in all countries, and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. And such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority, immediately or immediately, from this original. But in order to apply this to the particular exigencies of each individual, it is still necessary to have recourse to reason whose office it is to discover, as was before observed, what the law of nature directs in every circumstance of life, by considering what method will tend to most effectually to our own substantial happiness. And if our reason were always, as in our first ancestor before his transgression, clear and perfect, unruffled by passions, unclouded by prejudice, unimpaired by disease or intemperance, the task would be pleasant and easy. We should need no other guide but this. But every man now 
finds the contrary in his own experience, that his reason is corrupt, and his understanding full of ignorance and error. This has given manifold occasion for the benign interposition of divine providence, which, in companion to the frailty, the imperfection, and the blindness of human reason, has been pleased, at sun-dry times, and in diverse manners, to discover and enforce its laws by an immediate and direct revelation. The doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found only in the holy scriptures. These precepts, when revealed, are found upon comparison to be really a part of the original law of nature, as they tend in all their consequences to man's felicity. But we are not from thence to conclude that the knowledge of these truths was attainable by reason. In its present corrupted state, since we find that, until they were revealed, they were hid from the wisdom of ages. As then, the moral precepts of this law are indeed the same original with those of the law of nature, so their intrinsic obligation is of equal strength and perpetuity. Yet undoubtedly, the revealed law is, humanly speaking, of infinitely more authority than what we generally call the natural law, because one is the law of nature, expressly declared so to be by God himself. The other is only what, by the assistance of human reason, we imagine to be that law. If we could be as certain of the latter as we are of the former, both would have an equal authority. But, till then, they can never be put in any competition together. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human laws should be suffered to contradict these. There is, it is true, a great number of indifferent points, in which both the divine and the natural leave a man at his own liberty, but which are found necessary for the benefit of society to be restrained within certain limits. And herein it is that human laws have their greatest force and efficacy. For, with regard to such points as are not indifferent, human laws are only declaratory of an act in subordination to the former. To instance, in the case of murder, this is expressly forbidden by the divine and demonstrably by the natural law, and from these prohibitions arises the true unlawfulness of this crime. Those human laws that annex a punishment to it do not at all increase its moral guilt or superadd any fresh obligation in foro conscientiae to abstain from its perpetration. Nay, if any human law should allow or enjoin us to commit it, we are bound to transgress that human law, or else we must offend both the natural and the divine. But with regard to matters that are in themselves indifferent, and are not commanded or forbidden by those superior laws, such, for instance, as exporting of wool into foreign countries, here the inferior legislature has scope and opportunity to interpose and to make that action unlawful, which before was not so. If man were to live in a state of nature, unconnected with other individuals, there would be no occasion for any other laws than the law of nature and the law of God. Neither could any other law possibly exist, for a law always supposes some superior who is to make it, and in a state of nature we are all equal, without any other superior but him who is the author of our being. But man was formed for society, and, as is demonstrated by the writers on this subject, is neither capable of living alone, nor indeed has the courage to do it. However, as it is impossible for the whole race of mankind to be united in one great society, they must necessarily divide into many, and form separate states, commonwealths, and nations, 
entirely independent of each other, and yet liable to a mutual intercourse. Hence arises a third kind of law to regulate this mutual intercourse, called the law of nations, which, as none of these states will acknowledge a superiority in the other, cannot be dictated by either, but depends entirely upon the rules of natural law, or upon mutual compacts, treaties, leagues, and agreements between these several communities, in the construction also of which compacts we have no other rule to resort to but the law of nature, being the only one to which both communities are equally subject. And therefore the civil law very justly observed, that quod naturalis ratio inter omnes omines constituit vocatur ius gentium. Thus much I thought it necessary to premise concerning the law of nature, the revealed law, and the law of nations, before I proceed to treat more fully of the principal subject of this section, municipal or civil law, that is, the rule by which particular districts, communities, or nations are governed, being thus defined by Justinian, Ius civile est quod quisque civi populus constituit. I call it municipal law, in compliance with common speech, for, though strictly, that expression denotes the particular customs of one single municipium, or free town, yet it may be sufficient propriety to be applied in any one state or nation which is governed by the same laws and customs. Municipal law, thus understood, is properly defined to be a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state, commanding what is right, and prohibiting what is wrong. Let us endeavor to explain its several properties, as they arise out of this definition. And first, it is a rule, not a transient sudden order, from a superior to, or concerning a particular person, but something permanent, uniform, and universal. Therefore, a particular act of the legislature to confiscate the goods of Titius, or to attain him of high treason, does not enter into the idea of a municipal law, for the operation of this act is spent upon Titius only, and has no relation to the community in general. It is rather a sentence than a law, but an act to declare that the crime of which Titius is accused shall be deemed high treason. This has permanency, uniformity, and universality, and therefore is properly a rule. It is also called a rule, to distinguish it from advice or counsel, which we are at liberty to follow or not as we see proper, and to judge upon the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the thing advised. Whereas our obedience to the law depends not only upon our approbation, but upon the Maker's will. Counsel is only matter of persuasion. Law is matter of injunction. Counsel acts only upon the willing. Law upon the unwilling also. It is also called a rule. To distinguish it from a compact or agreement, for a compact is a promise proceeding from us, law is a command directed to us. The language of a compact is, I will or will not do this. That of a law is, Thou shalt or shalt not do it. It is true there is an obligation which a compact carries with it, equal in point of conscience to that of a law. But then the original of the obligation is different. In compact we ourselves determine and promise what shall be done. Therefore we are obliged to do it. In laws we are obliged to act, without ourselves determining or promising anything at all. Upon these accounts, Law is defined to be a rule. Municipal law is also a rule of civil conduct. This distinguishes municipal law from the natural or revealed. 
the former of which is the rule of moral conduct, and the latter not only the rule of moral conduct, but also the rule of faith. These regard man as a creature, and point out his duty to God, to himself, and to his neighbor, considered in the light of an individual. But municipal or civil law regards him also as a citizen, and bound to other duties towards his neighbor, than those of mere nature and religion, duties which he has engaged in by enjoying the benefits of the common union, and which amount to no more than that he do contribute, on his part, to the subsistence and peace of the society. It is likewise a rule prescribed, because a beer resolution, confined in the breast of the legislator, without manifesting itself by some external sign, can never be properly a law. It is requisite that this resolution be notified to the people who are to obey it, but the manner in which this notification is to be made is matter of very great indifference. It may be notified by universal tradition and long practice, which supposes a previous publication, and is the case of the common law of England. It may be notified viva voce, by officers appointed for that purpose, as is done with regard to proclamations, and such acts of Parliament are appointed to be publicly read in churches and other assemblies. It may lastly be notified by writing, printing, or the like, which is the general course taken with all our acts of Parliament. Yet, whatever way is made use of, it is incumbent on the promulgators to do it in the most public and perspicuous manner, not like Caligula, who, according to Dio Cassius, wrote his laws in a very small character, and hung them up upon high pillars, the more effectually to ensnare the people. There is still a more unreasonable method than this, which is called making of laws ex post facto, when, after an action is committed, the legislator then, for the first time, declares it to have been a crime, and inflicts a punishment upon the person who has committed it. Here it is impossible that a party could foresee that an action, innocent when it was done, should be afterwards converted to guilt by a subsequent law. He had therefore no cause to abstain from it, and all punishment for not abstaining must of consequence be cruel and unjust. All laws should be therefore made to commence in futuro, and be notified before the commencement, which is implied in the term prescribed. But when this rule is in the usual manner notified, or prescribed, it is then the subject's business to be thoroughly acquainted therewith. For, if ignorance of what he might know were admitted as a legitimate excuse, the laws would be of no effect but might always be eluded, with impunity. But further, municipal law is a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state. For a legislature, as was before observed, it is the greatest act of superiority that can be exercised by one being over another. Wherefore, it is requisite to the very essence of the law that it be made by the supreme power, Sovereignty and legislature are indeed convertible terms. One cannot subsist without the other. This will naturally lead us into a short inquiry concerning the nature of society and civil government, and the natural, inherent right that belongs to the sovereignty of a state, wherever that sovereignty be lodged, of making and enforcing laws. End of section 5 Section 6. Part 2 of Section 2 of the Introduction to the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. Introduction. 
Section 2, Part 2 The only true and natural foundations of society are the wants and the fears of individuals. Not that we can believe, with some theoretical writers, that there ever was a time when there was no such thing as society, and that, from the impulse of reason, and through a sense of their wants and weaknesses, individuals met together in a large plain, entered into an original contract, and chose the tallest man present to be their governor. This notion, of an actually existing unconnected state of nature, is too wild to be seriously admitted. And besides, it is plainly contradictory to the revealed accounts of the primitive origin of mankind, and their preservation two thousand years afterwards, both which were effected by the means of single families. These formed the first society, among themselves, which every day extended its limits, and when it grew too large to subsist with convenience in that pastoral state, wherein the patriarchs appear to have lived, it necessarily subdivided itself by various migrations into more. Afterwards, as agriculture increased, which employs and can maintain a much greater number of hands, migrations became less frequent, and various tribes, which had formerly separated, reunited again, sometimes by compulsion and conquest, sometimes by accident, and sometimes perhaps by compact. But though society had not its formal beginning from any convention of individuals, actuated by their wants and their fears, yet it is the sense of their weakness and imperfection that keeps mankind together. That demonstrates the necessity of this union, and that therefore is the solid and natural foundation as well as the cement of society. And this is what we mean by the original contract of society, which, though perhaps in no instance it has ever been formally expressed at the first institution of a state, yet in nature and reason must always be understood and implied. In the very act of associating together, namely, that the whole should protect all its parts, and that every part should pay obedience to the will of the whole. Or, in other words, that the community should guard the rights of each individual member, and that, in return for this protection, each individual should submit to the laws of the community, without which submission of all it was impossible that protection could be certainly extended to any. For when society is once formed, government results, of course, as necessary to preserve and to keep that society in order, unless some superior were constituted, whose commands and decisions all members are bound to obey, they would still remain as in a state of nature, without any judge upon earth to define their several rights and redress their several wrongs. But as all the members of society are naturally equal, it may be asked in whose hands are the reins of government to be entrusted. To this, the general answer is easy, but the application of it to particular cases has occasioned one half of those mischiefs which are apt to proceed from misguided political zeal. In general, all mankind will agree that government should be reposed in such persons in whom those qualities are most likely to be found, the perfection of which are among the attributes of him who is emphatically styled the supreme being. The three grand requisites, I mean, of wisdom, of goodness, and of power. Wisdom, to discern the real interest of the community. Goodness, to endeavor always to pursue that real interest, and strength, or power, to carry this knowledge and intention into action. These are the natural foundations of sovereignty, and these are the requisites 
that ought to be found in every well-constituted frame of government. How the several forms of government we now see in the world at first actually began is a matter of great uncertainty, and has occasioned infinite disputes. It is not my business or intention to enter into any of them. However, they began, or by what right soever they subsist, there is, and must be, in all of them, a supreme, irresistible, absolute, uncontrolled authority, in which the jura sumi in peri, or the rights of sovereignty, reside. And this authority is placed in those hands, wherein, according to the opinion of the founders of such respective states, either expressly given, or collected from their tacit approbation, the qualities requisite for supremacy, wisdom, goodness, and power, are the most likely to be found. The political writers of antiquity will not allow more than three regular forms of government. The first, when the sovereign power is lodged in an aggregate assembly consisting of all the members of a community, which is called a democracy. The second, when it is lodged in a council, composed of select members, and then it is styled an aristocracy. The last, when it is entrusted in the hands of a single person, then it takes the name of a monarchy. All other species of government, they say, are either corruptions of, or reducible to, these three. By the sovereign power, as was before observed, is meant the making of laws. For wherever that power resides, all others must conform to, and be directed by it, whatever appearance the outward form and administration of the government may put on. For it is at any time in the option of the legislature to alter that form and administration by a new edict or rule and to put the execution of the laws into whatever hands it pleases. And all the other powers of the state must obey the legislative power in the execution of their several functions, or else the constitution is at an end. In a democracy, where the right of making laws resides in the people at large, public virtue, or goodness of intention, is more likely to be found than either of the other qualities of government. Popular assemblies are frequently foolish in their contrivance, and weak in their execution, but generally mean to do the thing that is right and just, and have always a degree of patriotism or public spirit. In aristocracies there is more wisdom to be found than in the other frames of government, being composed or intended to be composed, of the most experienced citizens. But there is less honesty in a republic, and less strength than in a monarchy. A monarchy is indeed the most powerful of any, all the sinews of government being knit together and united in the hand of the prince. But then there is an imminent danger of his employing that strength to improvident or oppressive purposes. Thus, these three species of government have, all of them, their several perfections and imperfections. Democracies are usually the best calculated to direct the end of a law. Aristocracies, to invent the means by which that end shall be obtained, and monarchies, to carry those means into execution. And the ancients, as was observed, had in general no idea of any other permanent form of government but these three. For though Cicero declares himself of opinion, esse optime constitutatem republicam, quae ex tribus generibus ilis regali, optimo e populari, sit modite confusa. Yet Tacitus treats this notion of a mixed government formed out of them all, and partaking of the advantages of each, as a visionary whim, and one that, if effected, 
could never be lasting or secure. But happily for us of this island, the British Constitution has long remained, and I trust will long continue, a standing exception to the truth of this observation. For, as with us, the executive power of the laws is lodged in a single person, they have all the advantages of strength and dispatch that are to be found in the most absolute monarchy, and, as the legislature of the kingdom is entrusted to three distinct powers, entirely independent of each other, first, the king, secondly, the lords spiritual and temporal, which is an aristocratical assembly of persons selected for their piety, their birth, their wisdom, their valor, or their property, and thirdly, the House of Commons, freely chosen by the people from among themselves, which makes it a kind of democracy. As this aggregates body, actuated by different springs, and attentive to different interests, composes the British Parliament, and has the supreme disposal of everything, there can no inconvenience be attempted by either of the three branches, but will be withstood by one of the other two, each branch being armed with a negative power, sufficient to repel any innovation which it shall think inexpedient or dangerous. Here, then, is lodged the sovereignty of the British Constitution, and lodged as beneficially as possible for society, for in no other shape could we be so certain of finding the three great qualities of government so well and so happily united. If the supreme power were lodged in any one of the three branches separately, we must be exposed to the inconveniences of either absolute monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy, and so want two of the three principal ingredients of good policy, either virtue, wisdom, or power. If it were lodged in any two of the branches, for instance, in the King and House of Lords, our laws might be providently made and well executed, but they might not always have the good of the people in view. If lodged in the King and Commons, we should want that circumspection and mediatory caution which the wisdom of the peers is to afford. If the supreme rights of legislature were lodged in the two houses only, and the king had no negative upon their proceedings, they might be tempted to encroach upon the royal prerogative, or perhaps to abolish the kingly office, and thereby weaken, if not totally destroy, the strength of the executive power. But the constitutional government of this island is so admirably tempered and compounded that nothing can endanger or hurt it, but destroying the equilibrium of power between one branch of the legislature and the rest. For if ever it should happen that the independence of any one of the three should be lost, or that it should become subservient to the views of either of the other two, there would soon be an end to our Constitution. The legislature would be changed from that which was originally set up by the general consent and fundamental act of the society. And such a change, however effected, is, according to Mr. Locke, who perhaps carries his theory too far, at once an entire dissolution of the bands of government, and the people will be reduced to a state of anarchy, with liberty to constitute to themselves a new legislative power. Having thus cursorily considered the three usual species of government, and our own singular constitution, selected and compounded from them all, I proceed to observe that, as the power of making laws constitutes the supreme authority, so wherever the supreme authority in any state resides, it is the right of that authority to make laws, that is, in the words of our definition, to prescribe the rule of civil action. And this may be discovered from the very end and institution of civil states. For a state is a collective body, 
composed of a multitude of individuals, united for their safety and convenience, and intending to act together as one man. If it therefore is to act as one man, it ought to act by one uniform will. But, inasmuch as political communities are made up of many natural persons, each of whom has his particular will and inclination, these several wills cannot, by any natural union, be joined together, or tempered and disposed into a lasting harmony, so as to constitute and produce that one uniform will of the whole. It can therefore be no otherwise produced than by a political union, by the consent of all persons to submit to their own private wills, to the will of one man, or of one or more assemblies of men, to whom the supreme authority is entrusted. And this will of that one man, or assemblage of men, is in different states, according to their different constitutions, understood to be law. Thus far, as to the right of the supreme power to make laws, but further, it is its duty likewise. For since the respective members are bound to conform themselves to the will of the state, it is expedient that they receive directions from the state declaratory of that its will. But since it is impossible, in so great a multitude, to give injunctions to every particular man, relative to each particular action, therefore the state establishes general rules, for the perpetual information and direction of all persons in all points, whether of positive or negative duty. And this, in order that every man may know what to look upon as his own, what as another's, what absolute and what relative duties are required at his hands, what is to be esteemed honest, dishonest, or indifferent, what degree every man retains of his natural liberty, what he has given up as the price of the benefits of society, and after what manner each person is to moderate the use and exercise of those rights which the state assigns him, in order to promote and secure the public tranquillity. From what has been advanced, the truths of the former branch of our definition is, I trust, sufficiently evident that municipal law is a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state. I proceed now to the latter branch of it, that it is a rule so prescribed, commanding what is right, and prohibiting what is wrong. Now, in order to do this completely, it is first of all necessary that the boundaries of right and wrong be established and ascertained by law, and when this is once done, it will follow, of course, that it is likewise the business of the law, considered as a rule of civil conduct, to enforce these rights and to restrain or redress these wrongs. It remains, therefore, only to consider in what manner the law is said to ascertain the boundaries of right and wrong, and the methods which it takes to command the one and prohibit the other. For this purpose every law may be said to consist of several parts. 1. Declaratory, whereby the rights to be observed and the wrongs to be eschewed are clearly defined and laid down. Another, Directory, whereby the subject is instructed and enjoined to observe those rights and to abstain from the commission of those wrongs. A third, Remedial, whereby a method is pointed out to recover a man's private rights or redress his private wrongs, to which may be added a fourth, usually termed the sanction, or vindicatory branch of the law, whereby it is signified that evil or penalty shall be incurred by such as commit any public wrongs, and transgress or neglect their duty. With regard to the first of these, the declaratory part of the municipal law, this depends not so much upon the law of revelation or of nature as upon the wisdom and will of the legislature. This doctrine, which before was slightly touched, 
deserves a more particular explication. Those rights than which God and nature have established, and are therefore called natural rights, such as our life and liberty, need not the aid of human laws to be more effectually inverted in every man than they are. Neither do they receive any additional strength when declared by the municipal laws to be inviolable. On the contrary, no human legislator has power to abridge or destroy them, unless the owner shall himself commit some act that amounts to a forfeiture. Neither do divine or natural duties, such as, for instance, the worship of God, the maintenance of children, and the like, receive any stronger sanction from being also declared to be duties by the law of the land. The case is the same as to crimes and misdemeanors that are forbidden by the superior laws, and therefore styled mala in se, such as murder, theft, and perjury, which contract no additional turpitude from being declared unlawful by the inferior legislature. For that legislature in all these cases acts only, as was before observed, in subordination to the great lawgiver, transcribing and publishing his precepts, so that, upon the whole, the declaratory part of the municipal law has no force or operation at all, with regard to actions that are naturally and intrinsically right or wrong. But, with regard to things in themselves indifferent, the case is entirely altered. These become either right or wrong, just or unjust, duties or misdemeanors, according as the municipal legislator sees proper for promoting the welfare of the society and more effectually carrying on the purposes of civil life. Thus, our own common law has declared that the goods of the wife do instantly upon marriage become the property and right of the husband, and our statute law has declared all monopolies a public offence. Yet that right and this offence have no foundation in nature, but are merely created by the law for the purposes of civil society. And sometimes, where the thing itself has its rise from the law of nature, the particular circumstance and mode of doing it become right or wrong, as the laws of the land shall direct. Thus, for instance, in civil duties, obedience to superiors is the doctrine of revealed as well as natural religion. But who those superiors shall be, and in what circumstances, or to what degrees they shall be obeyed, is the province of human laws to determine. And so, as to injuries or crimes, it must be left to our own legislature to decide in what cases the seizing of another's cattle shall amount to the crime of robbery, and where it shall be a justifiable action, as when a landlord takes them by way of distress for rent. Thus much for the declaratory part of the municipal law, and the directory stands much upon the same footing. For this virtually includes the former, the declaration being usually collected from the direction. The law that says, Thou shalt not steal, implies a declaration that stealing is a crime. And we have seen that, in things naturally indifferent, the very essence of right and wrong depend upon the direction of the laws to do or to omit it. The remedial part of a law is so necessary a consequence of the former two that laws must be very vague and imperfect without it. For in vain would rights be declared, in vain directed to be observed, if there were no method of recovering and asserting those rights when wrongfully withheld or invaded. This is what we mean, properly, when we speak of the protection of the law, when, for instance, the declaratory part of the law has said that the field or inheritance which belonged to Titius's father is vested by his death in Titius, and the directory part has forbidden any one to enter on another's property without the leave of the owner, if Gaius 
after this will presume to take possession of the land. The remedial part of the law will then interpose its office, will make Gaius restore the possession to Titius, and also pay him damages for the invasion. With regard to the sanction of laws, or the evil that may attend the breach of public duties, it is observed that human legislators have for the most part chosen to make the sanction of their laws rather vindicatory than remuneratory, or to consist rather in punishments than in actual particular rewards, because in the first part the quiet enjoyment and protection for all our civil rights and liberties, which are the sure and general consequence of obedience to the municipal law, are in themselves the best and most valuable of all rewards, because also were the exercise of every virtue to be enforced by the proposal of particular rewards, it were impossible for any state to furnish stock enough for so profuse a bounty. And further, because the dread of evil is a much more forcible principle of human actions than the prospect of good, for which reasons, though a prudent bestowing of rewards is sometimes of exquisite use, yet we find that those civil laws which enforce and enjoin our duty do seldom, if ever, propose any privilege or gift to such as obey the law, but do constantly come armed with a penalty denounced against transgressors, either expressly defining the nature and quantity of the punishment, or else leaving it to the discretion of the judges and those who are entrusted with the care of putting the law in execution. Of all the parts of a law, the most effectual is the vindicatory, for it is but lost labor to say, do this, or avoid that, unless we also declare, this shall be the consequence of your non-compliance. We must therefore observe that the main strength and force of a law consists in the penalty annexed to it. Herein is to be found the principal obligation of human laws. End of section 6 Section 7, part 3 of section 2 of the introduction of the commentaries on the laws of England, book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. Introduction. Section 2. Part 3. Legislators and their laws are said to compel and oblige not that by any natural violence they so constrain a man, as to render it impossible for him to act otherwise than as they direct, which is the strict sense of obligation, but because, by declaring and exhibiting a penalty against offenders, they bring it to pass that no man can easily choose to transgress the law, since, by reason of impending correction, compliance is in a high degree preferable to disobedience. And, even where rewards are proposed as well as punishments threatened, the obligation of the law seems chiefly to consist in the penalty. For rewards, in their nature, can only persuade and allure. Nothing is compulsory but punishment. It is held, it is true, and very justly, by the principle of our ethical writers, that human laws are binding upon men's consciences. But if that were the only or most forcible obligation, the good only would regard the law, and the bad would set them at defiance. And, true as this principle is, it must still be understood with some restriction. It holds, I apprehend, as to rights, and that, when the law has determined the field to belong to Titius, it is matter of conscience no longer to withhold or to invade it. So also, in regard to natural duties, and such offences, 
as are mala and se. Here we are bound in conscience, because we are bound by superior laws, before those human laws were in being, to perform the one and abstain from the other. But in revelation to those laws which enjoin only positive duties, and forbid only such things as are not mala and se, but mala prohibita, merely annexing a penalty to non-compliance, here I apprehend conscience is no further concerned than by directing a submission to the penalty, in case of our breach of those laws, for otherwise the multitude of penal laws in a state would not only be looked upon as an impolitic, but would also be a very wicked thing. If every such law were a snare for the conscience of the subject, but in these cases, the alternative is offered to every man, either abstain from this, or submit to such a penalty, and his conscience will be clear, whichever side of the alternative he thinks proper to embrace. Thus, by the statutes for preserving the game, a penalty is denounced against every unqualified person that kills a hare. Now this prohibitory law does not make the transgression a moral offense. The only obligation in conscience is to submit to the penalty if levied. I have now gone through the definition laid down of a municipal law, and have shown it that it is a rule of conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state, commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong, in the explication of which I have endeavored to interweave a few useful principles concerning the nature of civil government and the obligation of human laws. Before I conclude this section, it may not be amiss to add a few observations concerning the interpretation of laws. When any doubt arose upon the construction of the Roman laws, the usage was to state the case to the emperor in writing, and take his opinion upon it. This was certainly a bad method of interpretation. To interrogate the legislature, to decide particular disputes, is not only endless, but affords great room for partiality and oppression. The answers of the emperor were called his rescripts, and these had in succeeding cases the force of perpetual laws, though they ought to be carefully distinguished by every rational civilian from those general constitutions which had only the nature of things for their guide. The emperor Macrinius and his historian Capitolinus informs us had once resolved to abolish these rescripts and retain only the general edicts. He could not bear that the hasty and crude answers of such princes as Commodus and Caracalla should be reverenced as laws. But Justinian thought otherwise, and he has preserved them all. In like manner, the canon laws, or the creedal epistles of the popes, are all of them rescripts in the strictest sense. Contrary to all true forms of reasoning, they argue from particulars to generals, the fairest and most rational method to interpret the will of the legislator is by exploring his intentions at the time when the law was made, by signs the most natural and probable. And these signs are either the words, the context, the subject matter, the effects and consequence, or the spirit and reason of the law. Let us take a short view of them all. 1. Words are generally to be understood in their usual and most known signification, not so much regarding the propriety of grammar as their general and popular use. Thus, the law mentioned by Pufendorf, which forbade a layman to lay hands on a priest, was a judge to extend to him who had hurt a priest with a weapon. Again, terms of art, or technical terms, must be taken according to the acceptation of the learned in each art, trade, and science. So in the Act of Settlement, where the crown of England is limited to the Princess Sophia and the heirs of her body, being Protestants, it becomes necessary to call in the assistance of lawyers to ascertain the precise idea of the words heirs of her body, which in a legal sense comprise only certain of her lineal descendants. Lastly, where words are clearly repugnant in two laws, the later shall take place of the elder. Leges posteriores priores contrarias abrogant, 
is a maxim of universal law, as well as of our own constitutions. And accordingly, it was laid down by a law of the Twelve Tables at Rome, Quod populus postremum iusit, id ius ratum esto. 2. If words happen to be still dubious, we may establish their meaning from the context, with which it may be of singular use to compare a word or a sentence whenever they are ambiguous, equivocal, or intricate. Thus, the proem, or preamble, is often called in to help the construction of an act of parliament. Of the same nature and use is the comparison of a law with other laws that are made by the same legislator and have some affinity with the subject, or that expressly relate to the same point. Thus, when the law of England declares murder to be felony without benefit of clergy, we must resort to the same law of England to learn what the benefit of clergy is, and, when the common law censures the monarchical contracts, it affords great light to the subject to consider what the canon law has adjudged to be simony. 3. As to the subject matter, words are always to be understood as having a regard thereto, for that it is always supposed to be in the eye of the legislator, and all his expressions directed to that end. Thus, when the law of our Edward III forbids all ecclesiastical persons to purchase provisions at Rome, it might seem to prohibit the buying of grain and other victual, but when we consider that the statute was made to repress the usurpations of the papal see, and that the nominations to vacant benefices by the Pope were called provisions, we shall see that the restraint is intended to be laid upon such provisions only. 4. As to the effects and consequences, the rule is, where words bear either none, or a very absurd signification, if literally understood, we must a little deviate from the received sense of them. Therefore, the Bolognian law, mentioned by Puffendorf, which enacted that whosoever drew blood in the streets should be punished with the utmost severity, was held long after debate not to extend to the surgeon who opened the vein of a person that fell down in the street with a fit. 5. But lastly, the most universal and effectual way of discovering the true meaning of a law, when the words are dubious, is by considering the reason and spirit of it, or the cause which moved the legislator to enact it. For when this reason ceases, the law itself ought likewise to cease with it. An instance of this is given in a case put by Cicero, or whoever was the author of the rhetorical treatise inscribed to Herennius. There was a law that those who had in a storm forsook the ship should forfeit all property therein, and the ship and landing should belong entirely to those who stayed in it. In a dangerous tempest all the mariners forsook the ship, except only one sick passenger, who by reason of his disease was unable to get out and escape. By chance the ship came safe to port, the sick man kept possession, and claimed the benefit of the law. Now here all the learned agree that the sick man is not within the reason of the law, for the reason of making it was to give encouragement to such as should venture their lives to save the vessel. But this is a merit, which he could never pretend to, who neither stayed in the ship upon that account, nor contributed anything to its preservation. From this method of interpreting laws, by reason of them, arises what we call equity, which is thus defined by Grotius, the correction of that, wherein the law, by reason of its universality, is deficient. For since in laws all cases cannot be foreseen or expressed, it is necessary that when the general decrees of the law come to be applied to particular cases, there should be somewhere a power vested of accepting those circumstances which, had they been foreseen, the legislator himself would have accepted. And these are the cases which, as Grotius expresses it, lex non exacte definit, sed arbitrio, boni viri permitit. Equity, thus depending, essentially, upon the particular circumstances of each individual case, 
There can be no established rules and fixed precepts of equity laid down without destroying its very essence and reducing it to a positive law. And, on the other hand, the liberty of considering all cases in an equitable light must not be indulged too far, lest thereby we destroy all law and leave the decision of every question entirely in the breast of the judge. And law, without equity, though hard and disagreeable, is much more desirable for the public good than equity without law, which would make every judge a legislator and introduce most indefinite confusion, as there would then be almost as many different rules of action laid down in our courts as there are differences of capacity and sentiment in the human mind. End of section 7、Section 8, Part 1 of Section 3 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LIBRIVOX dot ORG. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. Introduction. Section 3. Part 1. Section the Third. Of the Laws of England. The municipal law of England, or the rule of civil conduct prescribed to the inhabitants of this kingdom, may, with sufficient propriety, be divided into two kinds, the lex non scripta, the unwritten, or common law, and the lex scripta, the written, or statute law. The lex non scripta, or unwritten law, includes not only general customs, or the common law properly so called, but also the particular customs of certain parts of the kingdom, and likewise those particular laws that are by custom observed only in certain courts and jurisdictions. When I call these parts of our law legis non scripte, I would not be understood as if all those laws were at present merely oral, or communicated from the former ages to the present, solely by word of mouth. It is true, indeed, that in the profound ignorance of letters which formerly overspread the whole Western world, all laws were entirely traditional. For this plain reason, that the nations among which they prevailed had but little idea of writing. Thus, the British, as well as the Gallic Druids, committed all their laws as well as learning to memory. And it is said of the primitive Saxons here, as well as their brethren on the continent, that legis sola memoria eusu retinebant. But, with us at present, the monuments and evidences of our legal customs are contained in the records of the several courts of justice, in books of reports, and judicial decisions, and in the treatises of learned sages of the profession, preserved and handed down to us from the times of highest antiquity. However, I therefore style these parts of our law legis non scripte, because their original institution and authority are not set down in writing, as acts of Parliament are, but they receive their binding power and the force of laws by long and immemorial usage and by their universal reception throughout the kingdom. In like manner, as Aulus Gallius defines the jus non scriptum to be that which is tacito et illiterato ominum consensu emoribu expressum. Our ancient lawyers, and particularly Fortescue, insist with abundance of warmth that these customs are as old as the primitive Britons, and continued down through the several mutations of government and inhabitants to the present time, unchanged and unadulterated. 
This may be the case as to some, but in general, as Mr. Selden in his notes observes, this assertion must be understood with many grains of allowance, and ought only to signify, as the truth seems to be, that there never was any formal exchange of one system of laws for another, though doubtless by the intermixture of adventitious nations, the Romans, the Picts, the Saxons, the Danes, and the Normans, they must have insensibly introduced and incorporated many of their own customs with those that were before established, thereby, in all probability, improving the texture and wisdom of the whole, by the accumulated wisdom of diverse particular countries. Our laws, saith Lord Bacon, are mixed as our language, and as our language is so much the richer, our laws are the more complete. And indeed, our antiquarian and first historians do all positively assure us that our body of laws is of this compounded nature. For they tell us that in the time of Alfred the local customs of the several provinces of the kingdom were grown so various that he found it expedient to compile his dome book, or Liber Judicialis, for the general use of the whole kingdom. This book is said to have been extant so late as the reign of King Edward IV, but is now unfortunately lost. It contained, we may probably suppose, the principal maxims of the common law, the penalties for misdemeanors, and the forms of judicial proceedings. Thus much may at least be collected from that injunction to observe it, which we find in the laws of King Edward the Elder, the son of Alfred. Omnibus qui republicae praesunt, etiam atque etiam mando, ut omnibus aequos se praeban judices, perinde ac in judiciali libro, in parenthesis, saxonise, sombec. Scriptum habetur, nec quicam formident, quin ius commune, in parenthesis, saxonise, folkrichte, audacter libereque dicant. But the interruption and establishment of the Danes in England, which followed soon after, introduced new customs and caused this code of Alfred in many provinces to fall into disuse, or at least to be mixed and debased with other laws of a coarser alloy, so that, about the beginning of the eleventh century, there were three principal systems of laws prevailing in different districts. 1. The Mersenlage, or Mersen laws, which were observed in many of the Midland countries, and those bordering on the Principality of Wales, the retreat of ancient Britons, and therefore very probably intermixed with the British or Druidical customs. 2. The West Saxon Lage, or laws of the West Saxons, which obtained in the countries to the south and west of the island, from Kent to Devonshire. These were probably much the same with the laws of Alfred above mentioned, being the municipal law of the far most considerable part of his dominions, and particularly including Berkshire, the seat of his peculiar residence. 3. The Danelage, or Danish law, the very name of which speak its original and composition. This was principally maintained in the rest of the Midland countries, and also on the eastern coast, the seat of that piratical people. As for the very northern provinces, they were at that time under a distinct government. Out of these three laws, Roger Hoveden and Ranulphus Sestrensis inform us, King Edward the Confessor extracted one uniform law, or digest of laws, to be observed throughout the whole kingdom, though Hoveden and the author of an old manuscript chronicle assure us likewise that this work was projected and begun by his grandfather King Edgar, and indeed a general digest of the same nature has been constantly found expedient, 
and therefore put in practice by other great nations, formed from an assemblage of little provinces, governed by peculiar customs. As in Portugal, under King Edward, about the beginning of the fifteenth century. In Spain, under Alonso X, who about the year 1250 executed the plan of his father St. Ferdinand and collected all the provincial customs into one uniform law in the celebrated code entitled Las Partidas. And in Sweden, about the same area, a uniform body of common law was compiled out of the particular customs established by the Lachman of every province, and entitled the Lands Lach, being analogous to the common law of England. Both these undertakings, of King Edgar and Edward the Confessor, seem to have been no more than a new edition, or fresh promulgation, of Alfred's Code of Donbuk, with such additions and improvements as the experience of a century and a half had suggested. For Alfred is generally styled, by the same historians, the Legum Anglicanarum Conditor, as Edward the Confessor is the Restitutor. These, however, are the laws which our histories so often mention under the name of the laws of Edward the Confessor, which our ancestors struggled so hardly to maintain under the first princes of the Norman line, and which subsequent princes so frequently promised to keep and to restore, as the most popular act they could do, when pressed by foreign emergencies or domestic discontents. These are the laws that so vigorously withstood the repeated attacks of the civil law, which established in the twelfth century a new Roman empire over most of the states on the continent, states that have lost, and perhaps upon that account, their political liberties, while the free constitution of England, perhaps upon the same account, has been rather improved than debased. These, in short, are the laws which gave rise and original to that collection of maxims and customs, which is now known by the name of the common law, a name either given to it, in contradistinction to other laws, as the statute law, the civil law, the law merchant, and the like, or, more probably, as a law common to all the realm, the jus commune, or Volkrecht, mentioned by King Edward the Elder. After the abolition of the several provincial customs and particular laws before mentioned. But though this is the most likely foundation of this collection of maxims and customs, yet the maxims and customs so collected are of higher antiquity than memory or history can reach. Nothing being more difficult than to ascertain the precise beginning and first spring of an ancient and long-established custom. Whence it is that in our law the goodness of a custom depends upon its having been used time out of mind, or, in the solemnity of our legal phrase, the time whereof the memory of man runneth nor to the contrary. This it is that gives it its weight and authority, and of this nature are the maxims and customs which compose the common law, or lex non scripta, of this kingdom. This unwritten, or common law, is properly distinguishable into three kinds. One, general customs, which are the universal rule of the whole kingdom, and form the common law, in its stricter and more usual signification. Two, particular customs, which for the most part affect only the inhabitants of particular districts. Three, certain particular laws, which by custom are adopted and used by some particular courts, or pretty general and extensive jurisdiction. 1. As to general customs, or the common law, properly so called. This is that law by which proceedings and determinations 
in the king's ordinary courts of justice, are guided and directed. This, for the most part, settles the course in which lands descend by inheritance, the manner and form of acquiring and transferring property, the solemnities and obligation of contracts, the rules of expounding wills, deeds, and acts of parliament, the respective remedies of civil injuries, the several species of temporal offences, with the manner and degree of punishment, and an infinite number of minuter particulars, which diffuse themselves as extensively as the original distribution of common justice requires. Thus, for example, that there shall be four superior courts of record, the chancery, the king's bench, the common pleas, and the exchequer, that the eldest son alone is heir to his ancestor, that property may be acquired and transferred by writing, that a deed is of no validity unless sealed, that wills shall be construed more favorably, and deeds more strictly, that money lent upon bond is recoverable by action of debt, that breaking the public peace is an offense, and punishable by fine and imprisonment. All these are doctrines that are not set down in any written statute or ordinance, but depend merely upon immemorial usage, that is, upon common law for their support. Some have divided the common law into two principal grounds or foundations. One, established customs, such as that where there are three brothers, the eldest brother shall be heir to the second, in exclusion of the youngest, and two, established rules and maxims, as that the king can do no wrong, that no man shall be bound to accuse himself, and the like. But I take these to be one and the same thing, for the authority of these maxims rest entirely upon general reception and usage, and the only method of proving that this or that maxim is a rule of the common law is by showing that it hath been always the custom to observe it. But here a very natural and very material question arises. How are these customs or maxims to be known, and by whom is their validity to be determined? The answer is, by the judges, in the several courts of justice. They are the depository of the laws, the living oracles, who must decide in all cases of doubt, and who are bound by an oath to decide according to the law of the land. Their knowledge of that law is derived from experience and study, from the viginti anorum lucubrationis, which Fortescue mentions, and from being long personally accustomed to the judicial decisions of their predecessors. And indeed, these judicial decisions are the principal and most authoritative evidence that can be given of the existence of such a custom as shall form a part of the common law. The judgment itself, and all the proceedings previous thereto, are carefully registered and preserved, under the name of records, in public repositories set apart for that particular purpose, and to them frequent recourse is had, when any critical question arises, in the determination of which former precedent may give light or assistance. And therefore, even so early as the conquest, we find the Praeteritorum Memoria Eventorum reckoned up as one of the chief qualifications of those who were held to be legibus patriae optimi instituti. For it is an established rule to abide by former precedents, where the same points come again in litigation, as well to keep the scale of justice even and steady, and not liable to waver with every new judge's opinion, as also because the law in that case being solemnly declared and determined, what before was uncertain, and perhaps indifferent, is now become a permanent rule, which is not in the breast of any subsequent judge to alter or vary from, according to his private sentiments, he being sworn to determine, not according to his own private judgment, but according to the known laws 
and customs of the land, not delegated to pronounce a new law, but to maintain and expound the old one. Yet this rule admits of exception, where the former determination is most evidently contrary to reason, much more if it be contrary to the divine law. But even in such cases, the subsequent judges do not pretend to make a new law, but to vindicate the old one from misrepresentation. For if it be found that the former decision is manifestly absurd or unjust, it is declared not that such a sentence was a bad law, but it was not law, that is, that it is not the established custom of the realm, as has been erroneously determined. And hence it is that our lawyers are with justice so copious in their encomiums on the reason of the common law, that they tell us that the law is the perfection of reason, that it always intends to conform thereto, and that what is not reason is not law. Not that the particular reason of every rule in the law can at this distance of time be always precisely assigned, but it is sufficient that there be nothing in the rule flatly contradictory to reason, and then the law will presume it to be well founded. And it has been an ancient observation in the laws of England that whenever a standing rule of law, of which the reason perhaps could not be remembered or discerned, has been wantonly broke in upon by statutes or new resolutions, the wisdom of the new rule has in the end appeared from the inconveniences that have followed the innovation. The doctrine of the law, then, is this, that precedents and rules must be followed, unless flatly absurd or unjust, for though their reason be not obvious at first view, yet we owe such a deference to former times as not to suppose they acted wholly without consideration. To illustrate this doctrine by examples, it has been determined, time out of mind, that a brother of the half-blood, i.e., where they have only one parent the same, and the other different, shall never succeed as heir to the estate of his half-brother, but it shall rather as cheat to the king or other superior lord. Now this is a positive law, fixed and established by custom, which custom is evidenced by judicial decisions, and therefore can never be departed from by any modern judge without a breach of his oath and the law, for herein is nothing repugnant to natural justice. Though the reason of it, drawn from the feudal law, may not be quite obvious to everybody, and therefore, on account of a supposed hardship upon the half-brother, a modern judge might wish it had been otherwise settled. Yet it is not in his power to alter it. But if any court were now to determine that an elder brother of the half-blood might enter upon and seize any lands that were purchased by his younger brother, no subsequent judges would scruple to declare that such prior determination was unjust, was unreasonable, and therefore was not law. So that the law and the opinion of the judge are not always convertible terms, or one and the same thing, since sometimes may happen that the judge may mistake the law. Upon the whole, however, we may take it as a general rule that the decisions of courts of justice are the evidence of what is common law, in the same manner as, in the civil law, what the emperor had once determined was to serve for a guide for the future. The decisions, therefore, of courts are held in the highest regard, and are not only preserved as authentic records in the treasuries of the several courts, but are handed out to public view in the numerous volumes of reports which furnish the lawyer's library. These reports are histories of the several cases with a short summary of the proceedings, which are preserved at large in the record, their arguments on both sides, and the reasons the court gave for their judgment. 
taken down in short notes by persons present at the determination. And these serve as indexes to, and also to explain, the records, which always, in matters of consequence and nicety, the judges direct to be searched. The reports are extant in a regular series from the reign of King Edward the Second inclusive and from this time to that of Henry the Eighth, were taken by the personatories, or chief scribes, of the court, at the expense of the crown, and published annually, whence they are known under the denomination of the yearbooks. And it is much to be wished that this beneficial custom had, under proper regulations, been continued to this day. For, though King James I at the instance of Lord Bacon, appointed two reporters with a handsome stipend for this purpose. Yet that wise institution was soon neglected, and from the reign of Henry the Eighth to the present time, this task has been executed by many private and contemporary hands, who sometimes, through haste and inaccuracy, sometimes through mistake and want of skill, have published very crude and imperfect, perhaps contradictory, accounts of one and the same determination. Some of the most valuable of the ancient reports are those published by Lord Chief Justice Cook, a man of infinite learning in his profession, though not a little infected with the pedantry and quaintness of the times he lived in, which appear strongly in all his works. However, his writings are so highly esteemed that they are generally cited without the author's name. Beside these reporters, there are also other authors to whom great veneration and respect is paid by the students of the common law. Such are Glanville and Bracton, Britton and Flitta, Littleton and Fitzherbert, with some others of ancient date whose treatises are cited as authority, and are evidence that cases have formerly happened in which such and such points were determined, which are now become settled and first principles. One of the last of these methodical writers in point of time, whose works are of any intrinsic authority in the courts of justice, and do not entirely depend on the strength of their quotations from older authors, is the same learned judge we have just mentioned, Sir Edward Cook, who hath written four volumes of institutes, as he is pleased to call them, though they have little of the institutional method to warrant such a title. The first volume is a very extensive comment upon a little excellent treatise of tenures, compiled by Judge Littleton in the reign of Edward the Fourth. This comment is a rich mine of valuable common-law learning, collected and heaped together from the ancient reports and yearbooks, but greatly defective in methods. The second volume is a comment upon many old acts of Parliament, without any systematical order. The third, a more methodical treatise of the pleas of the Crown, and the fourth, an account of the several species of courts, and thus much for the first crown and chief cornerstone of the laws of England, which is generally memorial custom, or common law, from time to time declared in the decisions of the courts of justice, which decisions are preserved among our public records, explained in our reports, and digested for general use in the authoritative writing of the venerable sages of the law. End of section 8. Section 9, Part 2 of Section 3 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G Recording by J.C. Guan Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton Book 1 Introduction Section 3 Part 2 
the Roman law, as practice in the times of its liberty, paid also a great regard to custom, but not so much as our law, it only then adopting it when the written law is deficient, though the reasons alleged in the digest will fully justify our practice in making it of equal authority with, when it is not contradicted by, the written law. For since, says Julianus, the written laws binds us for no other reason but because it is approved by the judgment of the people. Therefore, those laws which the people hath approved without writing ought also to bind everybody. For where is the difference whether the people declare their assent to a law by suffrage or by a uniform course of acting accordingly? Thus, they reason, while Rome had some remains of her freedom. But when the imperial tyranny came to be fully established, the civil laws speak a very different language. Quod principi placuit legis habet vigorem, cum populi ei et inoim omne sum imperium e potestatem conferat, says Ulpian. Imperator solus e conditor et interpres legis existimatur, says the Code. And again, Sacrilegi instar es rescripto principis obiare. And indeed, it is one of the characteristic marks of English liberty that our common law depends upon custom, which carries this internal evidence of freedom along with it, that it probably was introduced by the voluntary consent of the people. 2. The second branch of the unwritten laws of England are particular customs, or laws which affect only the inhabitants of particular districts. These particular customs, or some of them, are without doubt the remains of that multitude of local customs before mentioned, out of which the common law, as it now stands, was collected at first by King Alfred, and afterwards by King Edgar and Edward the Confessor. Each district mutually sacrificing some of its own special urges, in order that the whole kingdom might enjoy the benefit of one uniform and universal system of laws. But for reasons that have been now long forgotten, particular countries, cities, towns, manors, and lordships were very early indulged with the privilege of abiding by their own customs, in contradiction to the rest of the nation at large, which privilege is confirmed to them by several acts of Parliament. Such is the custom of gavelkind in Kent, and some other parts of the kingdom, though perhaps it was also general till the Norman conquest, which ordains, among other things, that not the eldest son only of the father shall succeed to his inheritance, but all the sons alike, and that, though the ancestor be attained and hanged, yet the heir shall succeed to his estate, without any escheat to the lord. Such is the custom that prevails in diverse ancient boroughs, and therefore called borough English, that the youngest son shall inherit the estate, in preference to all his elder brothers. Such is the custom in other boroughs that a widow shall be entitled, for her dower, to all her husband's lands, whereas at the common law she shall be endowed for one third part only. Such also are the special and particular customs of manners of which every one has more or less, and which binds all the copy, hold tenants that hold of the said manners. Such likewise is the custom of holding diverse inferior courts with power of trying causes, in cities and trading towns, the right of holding which, when no royal grant can be shown, depends entirely upon immemorial and established usage. Such, lastly, are many particular customs within the city of London, with regard to trade, apprentices, widows, orphans, and a variety of other matters, which are all contrary to the general law of the land, and are good only by special custom, though those of London 
are also confirmed by Act of Parliament. To this head may most properly be referred a particular system of customs, used only among one set of the king's subjects, called the Custom of Merchants, or Lex Mercatoria, which, however different from the common law, is allowed for the benefit of trade to be of the utmost validity in all commercial transactions, the maxim of law being that quilibet in sua arte credendum est. The rules relating to that particular custom regard either the proof of their existence, their legality when proved, or their usual method of allowance. And first, we will consider the rules of proof. As to Gavelkind and Borough English, the law takes particular notice of them, and there is no occasion to prove that such customs actually exist, but only that the lands in question are subject thereto. All other private customs must be particularly pleaded, and as well the existence of such customs must be shown, as that the thing in dispute is within the custom alleged. The trial in both cases, both to show the existence of the custom, as, quote, that in the manner of dill, lands shall descend only to the heir's male, and never to the heir's female, end quote, and also to show that the lands in question are within that manner, is by a jury of twelve men, and not by judges, except the same particular custom has been before tried, determined, and recorded in the same court. The customs of London differ from all others in point of trial, for, if the existence of the custom be brought in question, it shall not be tried by a jury, but by certificate from the Lord Mayor and Aldermen by the mouth of their recorder, unless it be such a custom as the corporation is itself interested in, as a right of taking a toll, etc., for then the law permits them not to certify on their own behalf. When a custom is actually proved to exist, the next inquiry is into the legality of it, for, if it is not a good custom, it ought to be no longer used. Malus usus, abolendus est, is an established maxim of the law. To make a particular custom good, the following are necessary requisites. 1. That it have been used so long, and that the memory of man runneth not to the contrary, so that, if any one can show the beginning of it, it is no good custom, for which reason no custom can prevail against an express act of Parliament, since the statute itself is a proof of a time when such a custom did not exist. 2. It must have been continued. Any interruption would cause a temporary seizing. The revival gives it a new beginning, which will be within time of memory, and thereupon the custom will be void. But this must be understood with regard to any interruption of the right. For an interruption of the possession only, for ten or twenty years, will not destroy the custom. As if I have a right of way by custom over another's field, the custom is not destroyed, though I do not pass over it for ten years. It only becomes more difficult to prove. But if the right be anyhow discontinued for a day, the custom is quite at an end. 3. It must have been peaceable and acquiesced in, no subject to contention and dispute. For as customs owe their original to common consent, their being immemorially disputed, either at law or otherwise, is a proof that such consent was wanting. 4. Customs must be reasonable, or rather, taken negatively, they must not be unreasonable, which is not always, as Sir Edward Cook says, to be understood of every unlearned man's reason, but of artificial and legal reason, warranted by authority of law, upon which account a custom may be good, though the particular reason of it cannot be assigned, for it suffices 
if no good legal reason can be assigned against it. Thus, a custom in a parish that no man shall put his beast into the common till the 3rd of October would be good, and yet it would be hard to show the reason why that day in particular is fixed upon, rather than the day before or after. But a custom that no cattle shall be put in till the lord of the manor has first put in his is unreasonable, and therefore bad, for preadventure the lord will never put in his, and then the tenants will lose all their profits. 5. Customs ought to be certain. A custom that lands shall descend to the most worthy of the owner's blood is void. For how shall this worth be determined? But a custom to descend to the next male of the blood, exclusive of females, is certain, and therefore good. A custom to pay two pence an acre in lieu of tithes is good. But to pay sometimes two pence and sometimes three pence, as the occupier of the land pleases, is bad for its uncertainty. Yet a custom to pay a year's improved value for a fine on a copyhold estate is good, though the value is a thing uncertain. For the value may at any time be ascertained, and the maxim of law is, id certum est, quod certum redi potest. 6. Customs, though established by consent, must be, when established, compulsory, and not left to the option of every man, whether he will use them or not. Therefore, a custom that all the inhabitants shall be rated toward the maintenance of a bridge will be good. But a custom that every man is to contribute thereto at his own pleasure is idle and absurd, and indeed no custom at all. 7. Lastly, customs must be consistent with each other. One custom cannot be set up in opposition to another, for if both are really customs, they both are of equal antiquity, and both established by mutual consent, which to say of contradictory customs is absurd. Therefore, if one man prescribes that by custom he has a right to have windows looking into another's garden, the other cannot claim a right by custom to stop up or obstruct those windows. For these two contradictory customs cannot both be good, nor both stand together. He ought rather to deny the existence of the former custom. Next, as to the allowance of special customs. Customs, in derogation of the common law, must be construed strictly. Thus, by the custom of gavel kind, an infant of fifteen years may be one species of convenience, called a deed of fiefment, convey away his land in fee simple, or for ever. Yet this custom does not empower him to use any other convenience, or even to lease them for seven years. For the custom must be strictly pursued, and, moreover, all special customs must submit to the king's prerogative. Therefore, if the king purchases land of the nature of Gavelkind, where all the sons inherit equally, yet, upon the king's demise, his eldest son shall succeed to those lands alone. And thus much for the second part of the legis non scripte, or those particular customs which affect particular persons or districts only. 3. The third branch of them are those particular laws which by custom are adopted and used only in certain peculiar courts and jurisdictions. And by these I understand the civil and canon laws. It may seem a little improper at first view to rank these laws under the head of legis non scripte, or unwritten laws, seeing they are set forth by authority in their appendix, their codes, and their institutions, their councils, decrees, and decretals, and enforced by an immense number of expositions, decisions, and treatises of the learned in both branches of the law. But I do this after the example of Sir Matthew Hale, because it is most plain that it is not on account 
of there being written laws, that either the canon law or the civil law have any obligation within this kingdom. Neither do their force and efficacy depend upon their own intrinsic authority, which is the case of our written laws or acts of Parliament. They bind not the subjects of England, because their materials were collected from popes or emperors, were digested by Justinian, or declared to be authentic by Gregory. These considerations gave them no authority here, for the legislature of England doth not, nor ever did, recognize any foreign power as superior or equal to it in this kingdom, or as having the right to give law to any, the meanest of its subject. But all the strength that either the papal or imperial laws have obtained in this realm, or indeed in any other kingdom in Europe, is only because they have been admitted and received by immemorial usage and custom in some particular cases, and some particular courts, and then they form a branch of the leges non scripte, or customary law, or else, because they are in some other cases introduced by consent of Parliament, and then they owe their validity to the legis scripte, or statute law. This is expressly declared in those remarkable words of the statute 25, Henry the Eighth, chapter 21, addressed to the King's Royal Majesty. Quote, this your grace's realm, recognizing no superior under God, but only your grace, has been and is free from subjection to any man's laws, but only to such as have been devised, made, and ordained within this realm for the wealth of the same, or to such other, as by sufferance of your grace and your progenitors, the people of this your realm, have taken at their free liberty, by their own consent, to be used among them, and have bound themselves by long use and custom to the observance of the same, not as to the observance of the laws of any foreign prince, potentate, or prelate, but as to the customed and ancient laws of this realm, originally established as laws of the same, by the said sufferance, consents, and customs, and none otherwise. End quote. By the civil law, absolutely taken, is generally understood the civil or municipal law of the Roman Empire, as comprised in the institutes, the codes, and the digest of the Emperor Justinian, and the novel constitutions of himself and some of his successors, of which, as there will frequently be occasions to cite them, by way of illustrating our own laws, it may not be amiss to give a short and general account. The Roman law, founded first upon the regal constitutions of their ancient kings, next upon the twelve tables of the Decemviri, then upon the laws or statutes enacted by the senate or people, the edex of the praetor, and the responsa prudentum, or opinions of learned lawyers, and lastly, upon the imperial decrees, or constitutions of successive emperors, has grown to so great a bulk, or, as Livy expresses it, quote, tam immensus aliarum super alias acervatarum legum cumulus, end quote, that they were computed to be many camels' loads by an author who preceded Justinian. This was in part remedied by the collection of three private lawyers, Gregorius, Hermogenes, and Papirius, and then by the Emperor Theodosius the Younger, by whose orders a code was compiled, A.D. 438, being a methodical collection of all the imperial constitutions then in force, which Theodosian code was the only book of civil law received as authentic in the western part of Europe till many centuries after, and to this it is probable that the Franks and Goths might frequently pay some regard in framing legal constitutions for their newly erected kingdoms. For Justinian commanded only 
in the eastern remains of the empire, and it was under his auspices that the present body of civil law was compiled and finished by Tribonian and other lawyers, about the year 533. This consists of, one, the Institutes, which contain the elements or first principles of the Roman law, in four books, two, the Digests, or Pendects, in fifty books, containing the opinions and writings of eminent lawyers, digested in a systematical method, three, a new code, or collection of imperial constitutions, the lapse of a whole century having rendered the former code of Theodosius imperfect. 4. The novels, or constitutions, posterior in time to the other books, and amounting to a supplement to the other code, containing new decrees of successive emperors, as new questions happened to arise. These form the body of Roman law, or Corpus Juris Civilis, as published about the time of Justinian, which, however, fell soon into neglect and oblivion, till about the year 1130, when a copy of the Digest was found at Amalfi in Italy, which accident, concurring with the policy of Romish ecclesiastics, suddenly gave new vogue and authority to the civil law, introduced it into several nations, and occasioned that mighty inundation of voluminous comments with which this system of law more than any other is now loaded. End of section 9section ten part three of section three of the introduction of the commentaries on the laws of england book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by j c guan commentaries on the laws of england by william blackston book one introduction section three Part three. The canon law is a body of Roman ecclesiastical law, relative to such matters as that church either has, or pretends to have, the proper jurisdiction over. This is compiled from the opinions of the ancient Latin fathers, the decrees of general councils, the decretal epistles and bulls of the Holy See, all which lay in the same disorder and confusion as the Roman civil law, till about the year 1151, one Grecian and Italian monk, animated by the discovery of Justinian's pandex at Amalfi, reduced them into some method in three books, which he entitled Concordia Discordantium Canonum, but which are generally known by the name of Decretum Graciani. These reached as low as the time of Pope Alexander the Third. The subsequent papal decrees to the pontificate of Gregory IX were published in much the same method under the auspices of that Pope about the year 1230 in five books entitled Decretalia Gregori Noni. A sixth book was added by Boniface the Eighth about the year 1298 which is called Sextus Decretalium. The Clementine Constitutions, or Decrees of Clement V, were in like manner authenticated in 1317 by his successor John the Twenty Second, who also published twenty constitutions of his own, called the Extravagantes Giovannis, all which in some measure answered to the novels of the civil law. To these have been since added some decrees of later popes in five books, called Extravagantes Comunes, and all these together, Gratian's Decree, Gregory's Decretals, the Sixth Decretal, the Clementine Constitutions, and the Extravagance of John and his successors, form the Corpus Iuri Canonici, or body of the Roman Canon Law. Besides these pontifical collections, 
which during the times of popery were received as authentic in this island, as well as in other parts of Christendom. There is also a kind of national canon law, composed of legatine and provincial constitutions, and adopted only to the exigencies of this church and kingdom. The legatine constitutions were ecclesiastical laws, enacted in national synods, held under the cardinals Otho and Otsobon. Legates from Pope Gregory IX and Pope Adrian IV, in the reign of King Henry III, about the years 1220 and 1268. The provincial constitutions are principally the decrees of provincial synods, held on the diverse archbishops of Canterbury, from Stephen Langton, in the reign of Henry III, to Henry Tuchelli, in the reign of Henry V, and adopted also by the province of York, in the reign of Henry VI, at the dawn of the Reformation, in the reign of King Henry VIII, it was enacted in Parliament that a review should be had of the canon law. Until such review should be made, all canons, constitutions, ordinances, and synodal provincial, being then already made, and not repugnant to the law of the land or the king's prerogative, should still be used and executed. And, as no such review has yet been perfected, upon this statute now depends the authority of the canon law in England. As for the canons enacted by the clergy under James I in the year 1603, and never confirmed in Parliament, it has been solely adjudged upon the principles of law and the Constitution, that where they are not merely declaratory of the ancient canon law, but are introductory of new regulations, they do not bind the laity, whatever regard the clergy may think proper to pay them. There are four species of courts in which the civil and canon laws are permitted under different restrictions to be used. 1. The courts of the archbishops and bishops and their derivative officers, usually called in our law courts Christian, curie Christianitatis, or the ecclesiastical courts, 2. The military courts. 3. The courts of admiralty. 4. The courts of the two universities. In all, the reception in general, and the different degrees of that reception, are grounded entirely upon custom, corroborated in the latter instance by Act of Parliament, ratifying those charters which confirm the customary law of the universities. The more minute consideration of these will fall properly under that part of these commentaries which treats of the jurisdiction of courts. It will suffice, at present, to remark a few particulars relative to them all, which may serve to inculcate more strongly the doctrine laid down concerning them. 1. And first, the courts of common law have the superintendency over these courts, to keep them within their jurisdictions, to determine wherein they exceed them, to restrain and prohibit such excess, and, in case of contumacy, to punish the officer who executes, and in some cases, the judge who enforces, the sentence so declared to be illegal. 2. The common law has reserved to itself the exposition of all such acts of Parliament, as concern either the extent of these courts, or the matters depending before them. And, therefore, if these courts either refuse to allow these acts of Parliament, or will expound them in any other sense than what the common law puts upon them, the King's courts at Westminster will grant prohibitions to restrain and control them. 3. An appeal lies from all these courts to the king, in the last resort, which proves that the jurisdiction exercised in them is derived from the crown of England, and not from any foreign patented or intrinsic authority 
of their own. And, from these three strong marks and ensigns of superiority, it appears beyond a doubt that the civil and canon laws, though admitted in some cases by custom in some courts, are only subordinate and legis subgraviori lege, and that, thus admitted, restrained, altered, new-modeled, and amended, they are by no means with us a distinct independent species of laws, but are inferior branches of the customary or unwritten laws of England, properly called the king's ecclesiastical, the king's military, the king's maritime, or the king's academical laws. Let us next proceed to the legis scripte, the written laws of the kingdom, which are statutes, acts, or edicts, made by the king's majesty, by and with the advice and content of the lords spiritual and temporal, and commons, in parliament assembled. The oldest of these now extant, and printed in our statute books, is the famous Magna Carta, as confirmed in Parliament, 9 Henry the Third, Though doubtless there were many acts before that time, the records of which are not lost, and the determinations of them, perhaps at present, currently received for the maxims of the old common law. The manner of making these statutes will be better considered hereafter, when we examine the constitution of parliaments. At present, we only take notice of the different kinds of statutes, and of some general rules which regard their construction. First, as to their several kinds. Statutes are either general or special, public or private. A general or public act is a universal rule that regards the whole community, and of these the courts of law are bound to take notice judicially and ex officio, without the statute being particularly pleaded or formally set forth by the party who claims an advantage under it. Special or private acts are rather exceptions than rules, being those which only operate upon particular persons and private concerns, such as the Romans entitled Senatus Decreta, in contradistinction to the Senatus Consulta, which regarded the whole community. And of these, the judges are not bound to take notice, unless they be formally shown and pleaded. Thus, to show the distinction, the statute 13 Elizabeth chapter 10, to prevent spiritual persons from making leases for longer terms than twenty-one years, or three lives, is a public act, it being a rule prescribed to the whole body of spiritual persons in the nation, but an act to enable the Bishop of Chester to make a lease to A.B. for sixty years is an exception to this rule. It concerns only the parties and the bishop's successors, and is therefore a private act. Statutes are also either declaratory of the common law, or remedial of some defects therein. Declaratory, where the old custom of the kingdom is almost fallen into disuse, or become disputable, in which case the parliament has thought proper in perpetuum rei testimonium, and for avoiding all doubts and difficulties, to declare what the common law is, and ever has been. Thus, the Statute of Treasons, 25, Edward III, Chapter 2, does not make any new species of treasons, but only, for the benefit of the subject, declares and enumerates those several kinds of offence, which before were treason at the common law. Remedial statutes are those which are made to supply such defects, and abrite such superfluities in the common law, as arise either from the general imperfection of all human laws, from change of time and circumstances, from the mistakes and unadvised determinations of unlearned judges, or from any other cause whatsoever. 
and, this being done, either by enlarging the common law where it was too narrow and circumscribed, or by restraining it where it was too lax and luxuriant. This has occasioned another subordinate division of remedial acts of Parliament into enlarging and restraining statutes. To instance again, in the case of treason, clipping the current coin of the kingdom was an offence not sufficiently guarded against by the common law. Therefore, it was thought expedient by statute 5, Elizabeth chapter 11, to make it high treason, which it was not at the common law, so that this was an enlarging statute. At common law also spiritual corporations might lease out their estates for any term of years till prevented by the statute 13, Elizabeth, before mentioned. This was therefore a restraining statute. Secondly, the rules to be observed with regard to the construction of statutes are principally these which follow. 1. There are three points to be considered in the construction of all remedial statutes, the old law, the mischief, and the remedy, that is, how the common law stood at the making of the act, what the mischief was, for which the common law did not provide, and what remedy the Parliament has provided to cure this mischief. And it is the business of the judges so to construct the act, as to suppress the mischief and advance the remedy. Let us instance again in the same restraining statute of 13 Elizabeth. By the common law, ecclesiastical corporations might let as long leases as they thought proper. The mischief was that they let long and unreasonable leases to the impoverished of their successors. The remedy applied by the statute was by making void all leases by ecclesiastical bodies for longer terms than three lives or twenty-one years. Now, in the construction of this statute, it is held that leases, though for a longer term, if made by a bishop, are not void during the bishop's life, or, if made by a dean with concurrence of his chapter, they are not void during the life of the dean, for the act was made for the benefit and protection of the successor. The mischief is therefore sufficiently suppressed by vacating them after the death of the grantor, but the leases, during their lives, being not within the mischief, are not within the remedy. 2. A statute which treats of things or persons of an inferior rank cannot, by any general words, be extended to those of a superior. So a statute treating of deans, prebendaries, parsons, vicars, and other having spiritual promotion, is held not to extend to bishops, though they have spiritual promotion, deans being the highest persons named, and bishops being of a still higher order. 3. Penal statutes must be construed strictly. Thus, a statute 1 Edward the Sixth, having enacted that those who are convicted of stealing horses should not have the benefit of clergy. The judges conceived that this did not extend to him that should steal but one horse, and therefore procured a new act for that purpose in the following year. And, to come nearer to our times, by the statute 14 George the Second, chapter 6, stealing sheep or other cattle, was made felony without benefit of clergy. But these general words, or other cattle, being looked upon as much too loose to create a capital offence, the act was held to extend to nothing but mere sheep, and therefore, in the next sessions, it was found necessary to make another statute, 15 George the Second, chapter 34, extending the former to bulls, cows, oxen, steers, bullocks, heifers, calves, and lambs.
by name. 4. Statutes against frauds are to be liberally and beneficially expounded. This may seem a contradiction to the last rule, most statutes against fraud being in their consequences penal. But this difference is here to be taken, where the statutes act upon the offender and inflicts a penalty, as the pillory or a fine, it is then to be taken strictly. But when the statute acts upon the offense, by setting aside the fraudulent transaction, here it is to be construed liberally. Upon this footing, the statute of 13 Elizabeth, chapter 5, which avoids all gifts of goods, etc., made to defraud creditors and others, was held to extend by the general words to a gift made to defraud the queen of a forfeiture. 5. One part of a statute must be so construed by another that the whole may, if possible, stand, ut res magis valeat, quam pereat, as if land be vested in the king and his heirs by act of parliament, saving the right of A, and A has at that time a lease of it for three years. Here A shall hold it for his term of three years, and afterwards it shall go to the king. But this interpretation furnishes matter for every clause of the statute to work and operate upon. But, 6. A saving, totally repugnant to the body of the act, is void. If, therefore, an act of Parliament vests land in the king and his heirs, saving the right of all persons whatsoever, or vests the land of A in the king, saving the right of A, in either of these cases, the saving is totally repugnant to the body of the statute, and, if good, would render the statute of no effect or operation. And, therefore, the saving is void, and the land vests absolutely in the king. 7. Where the common law and the statute differ, the common law gives place to the statute and an old statute gives place to a new one. And this, upon the general principle laid down in the last section, that legis posteriores priores contrarias abrogant. But this is to be understood only when the latter statute is couched in negative terms, or, by its matter, necessarily implies a negative as if a former act says that a juror upon such a trial shall have twenty pounds a year, and a new statute comes and says he shall have twenty marks. Here, the latter statute, though it does not express, yet necessarily implies a negative, and virtually repeals the former. For, if twenty marks be made qualification sufficient, the former statute which requires twenty pounds, is at an end. But, if both acts be merely affirmative, and the substance such that both may stand together, here the latter does not repeal the former, but they shall both have a concurrent efficacy. If by a former law an offence be indictable at the quarter sessions, and a lot law makes the same offence indictable at the assizes, here the jurisdiction of the sessions is not taken away, but both have a concurrent jurisdiction, and the offender may be prosecuted at either, unless the new statute subjoins express negative words, as that the offence shall be indictable at the assizes, and not elsewhere. 8. If a statute that repeals another is itself repealed afterwards, the first statute is hereby revived without any formal words for that purpose. So when the statutes of 26 and 35 Henry VIII, declaring the king to be the supreme head of the church, were repealed by a statute 1 and 2, Philip and Mary, and this latter statute was afterwards repealed by an act of 1 Elizabeth, 
there needed not any express words of revival in Queen Elizabeth's statute, but these acts of King Henry were implied and virtually revived. 9. Acts of Parliament, derogatory from the power of subsequent Parliament, bind not. So the statute 11, Henry the Seventh, chapter 1, which directs that no person for assisting a king de facto shall be attained of treason by act of Parliament or otherwise, is held to be good only as to common prosecutions for high treason, but will not restrain or clog any parliamentary attainder, because the legislature, being in truth the sovereign power, is always of equal, always of absolute authority. It acknowledged no superior upon earth, which the prior legislature must have been, if its ordinances could bind the present Parliament. And upon the same principle, Cicero, in his letters to Atticus, treats with a proper contempt these restraining clauses which endeavor to tie up the hands of succeeding legislatures. Quote, when you repeal the law itself, says he, you, at the same time, repeal the prohibitory clause which guards against such repeal. End quote. 10. Lastly, acts of Parliament that are impossible to be performed are of no validity, and if there arise out of them collaterally any absurd consequences, manifestly contradictory to common reason, they are, with regard to those collateral consequences, void. I lay down the rule with these restrictions, though I know it is generally laid down more largely, that acts of Parliament contrary to reason are void. But if the Parliament will positively enact a thing to be done which is unreasonable, I know of no power that can control it. And the examples usually alleged in support of this sense of the rule do none of them prove that where the main object of a statute is unreasonable, the judges are at liberty to reject it, for that were to set the judicial power above that of the legislature, which would be subversive of all government. But where some collateral matter arises out of the general words, and happens to be unreasonable, there the judges are in decency to conclude that this consequence was not foreseen by the Parliament, and therefore they are at liberty to expound the statute by equity, and only quod hoc disregard it. Thus, if an act of Parliament gives a man power to try all causes that arise within his manner of dale, yet, if a cause should arise in which he himself is party, the act is construed not to extend to that, because it is unreasonable that any man should determine his own quarrel. But, if we could conceive it possible for the Parliament to enact that he should try as well his own causes as those of other persons, there is no court that has power to defeat the intent of the legislature, when couched in such evident and express words, as leave no doubt whether it was the intent of the legislature or not. These are the several grounds of the laws of England, over and above which equity is also frequently called in to assist, to moderate, and to explain it. What equity is, and how impossible in its very essence to be reduced to stated rules, has been shown in the preceding section. I shall therefore only add that there are courts of this kind established for the benefit of the subject, to correct and soften the rigor of the law, when through its generality it bears too hard in particular cases, to detect and punish latent frauds, which the law is not minute enough to reach, to enforce the execution of such matters of trust and confidence as are binding in conscience, though perhaps not strictly legal, to deliver from such dangers as are owing to misfortune or oversight, and, in short, to relieve in all such cases as are bona fide 
objects of relief. This is the business of our courts of equity, which, however, are only conversant in matters of property. For the freedom of our Constitution will not permit that in criminal cases a power should be lodged in any judge to construe the law otherwise than according to the letter. This caution while it admirably protects the public liberty, can never bear hard upon individuals. A man cannot suffer more punishment than the law assigns, but he may suffer less. The laws cannot be strained by partiality to inflict a penalty beyond what the letter will warrant. But, in cases where the letter induces any apparent hardship, the Crown has the power to pardon. End of section 10. Section 11, Part 1 of Section 4 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LIBRIVOX dot ORG Recording by J. C. Guan Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton Book One Introduction Section Four Part One Section the Fourth On the Countries Subject to the Laws of England The Kingdom of England, over which our municipal laws have jurisdiction, includes not by the common law, either Wales, Scotland, or Ireland, or any other part of the king's dominions except the territory of England only. And yet the civil laws and local customs of this territory do now obtain, in part or in all, with more or less restrictions, in these and many other adjacent countries, of which it will be proper first to take a review, before we consider the kingdom of England itself, the original and proper subject of these laws. Wales had continued independent of England, unconquered and uncultivated, in the primitive pastoral state which Caesar and Tacitus ascribe to Britain in general, for many centuries. Even from the time of the hostile invasions of the Saxons, when the ancient and Christian inhabitants of the island retired to those natural entrenchments for protection from their pagan visitants, but when these invaders themselves were converted to Christianity and settled into regular and potent governments, this retreat of the ancient Britons grew every day narrower. They were overrun by little and little, gradually driven from one fastness to another, and by repeated losses, abridged their own wild independence. Very early in our history, we find their princes doing homage to the crown of England, till at length, in the reign of Edward I, who may justly be styled the conqueror of Wales, the line of their ancient princes were abolished, and the king of England's eldest son, became, as a matter of course, their titular prince, the territory of Wales being then entirely annexed to the dominion of the crown of England, or, as the statute of Brutland expresses it, terra valie cum in colis suis prius regi jure feudali subjecta, of which homage was the sign, iam in proprietatis dominium totaliter et cum integritate conversa est, et coronae regni Angliae tanquam pas corporis eustem annexa et unita. By the statute also of Wales, very material alterations were made in diverse parts of their laws, so as to reduce them nearer to the English standard, especially in the forms of their judicial proceedings. But, they still retained very much of their original policy, particularly their role of inheritance, viz., that their lands were divided equally among all the issue male, 
and did not descend to the eldest son alone. By other subsequent statutes, their provincial immunities were still further abridged. But the finishing stroke of their independency was given by the statute 27, Henry VIII, chapter 26, which, at the same time, gave the utmost advancement to their civil prosperity, by admitting them to a thorough communication of laws with the subjects of England. Thus were this brave people gradually conquered into the enjoyment of true liberty, being insensibly put upon the same footing, and made fellow-citizens with their conquerors. A generous method of triumph, which the Republic of Rome practised with great success, till she reduced all Italy to her obedience, by admitting the vanquished states to partake of the Roman privileges. It is enacted by this statute 27, Henry VIII, 1, that the dominion of Wales shall be for ever united to the kingdom of England, 2, that all Welshmen born shall have the same liberties as other the king's subjects, 3, the lands in Wales shall be inheritable according to the English tenures and rules of descent, 4, that the laws of England and no other shall be used in Wales, besides many other regulations of the polis of this principality, and the statute 34 and 35 Henry VIII, chapter 26, confirms the same, adds further regulations, divides it into twelve shares, and, in short, reduces it into the same order in which it stands at this day, differing from the kingdom of England in only a few particulars, and those too of the nature of privileges, such as having courts within itself, independent of the process of Westminster Hall, and some other immaterial peculiarities, hardly more than are to be found in many counties of England itself. The kingdom of Scotland, notwithstanding the union of the crowns on the ascension of their King James the Sixth, to that of England, continued an entirely separate and distinct kingdom for above a century, though an union had been long projected, which was judged to be more easy to be done, as both kingdoms were anciently under the same government, and still remained a very great resemblance, though far from an identity, in their laws. By an act of Parliament, 1. James I, Chapter 1. It is declared that these two mighty, famous, and ancient kingdoms were formerly one. And Sir Edward Cook observes how marvellous a conformity there was, not only in the religion and language of the two nations, but also in their ancient laws, the descent of the crown, their parliaments, their titles of nobility, their offices of state and of justice, their writs, their customs, and even the language of their laws. Upon which account he supposes the common law of each to have been originally the same, especially as their most ancient and authentic book, called Regiam Magistratum, and containing the rules of their ancient common law, is extremely similar to that of Glanville, which contains the principles of ours, as it stood in the reign of Henry the Second, and the many diversities subsisting between the two laws at present may be well enough accounted for from a diversity of practice in two large and uncommunicating jurisdictions, and from the acts of two distinct and independent parliaments, which have in many points altered and abrogated the old common law for both kingdoms. However, Sir Edward Cook and the politicians of that time conceived great difficulties in carrying on the projected union, but these were at length overcome, and the great work was happily effected in 1707. 5. Anne, when twenty-five articles of union were agreed to by the parliaments of both nations, the purport of the most considerable being as follows. 1. That on the 1st of May 1707, and for ever after, 
the kingdoms of England and Scotland shall be united into one kingdom, by the name of Great Britain. 2. The succession to the monarchy of Great Britain shall be the same as was before settled with regard to that of England. 3. The United Kingdom shall be represented by one Parliament. 4. There shall be a communication of all rights and privileges between the subjects of both kingdoms, except where it is otherwise agreed. 9. When England raises two million pounds by a land tax, Scotland shall raise forty-eight thousand pound. 16. 17. The standards of the coin, of weights, and of measures shall be reduced to those of England throughout the United Kingdoms. 18. The laws relating to trade, customs, and the excise shall be the same in Scotland as in England, but all the other laws of Scotland shall remain in force, but alterable by the Parliament of Great Britain. Yet, with this caution, that laws relating to public policy are alterable at the discretion of the Parliament. Laws relating to private rights are not to be altered but for the evident utility of the people of Scotland. 22. Sixteen peers are to be chosen to represent the peerage of Scotland in Parliament, and forty-five members to sit in the House of Commons. 23. The sixteen peers of Scotland shall have all privileges of Parliament, and all peers of Scotland shall be peers of Great Britain, and rank next after those of the same degree at the time of the Union, and shall have all privileges of peers, except sitting in the House of Lords and voting on the trial of a peer. These are the principle of the twenty-five Articles of Union, which are ratified and confirmed by Statute 5 and Chapter 8, in which statute there are also two Acts of Parliament recited, the one of Scotland, whereby the Church of Scotland and also the four universities of that kingdom, are established for ever, and all succeeding sovereigns are to take an oath inviolably to maintain the same. The other, of England, 5, and chapter 6, whereby the Acts of Uniformity of 13 Elizabeth and 13 Charles the Second, except as the same had been altered by Parliament at that time, and all other acts then in force for the preservation of the Church of England are declared perpetual, and it is stipulated that every subsequent king and queen shall take an oath inviolably to maintain the same within England, Ireland, Wales, and the town of Berwick upon Tweed. And it is enacted that these two acts, quote, shall forever be observed as fundamental and essential conditions of the Union. End quote. Upon these articles, an act of union, it is to be observed, one, that the two kingdoms are now so inseparably united that nothing can ever disunite them again, but an infringement of those points which, when they were separate and independent nations, it was mutually stipulated, shall be, quote, fundamental and essential conditions of the Union. End quote. 2. That whatever else may be deemed quote, fundamental and essential conditions, end quote, the preservation of the two churches, of England and Scotland, in the same state that they were in at the time of the Union, and the maintenance of the Acts of Uniformity which establish our common prayer, are expressly declared so to be. 3 that therefore any alteration in the constitutions of either those churches or in the liturgy of the Church of England would be an infringement of these quote, fundamental and essential conditions end quote, and greatly endanger the union. 4. That the municipal laws of Scotland are ordained to be still observed in that part of the island unless altered by Parliament, and 
as the Parliament has not yet thought proper, except in a few instances, to alter them, they still, with regard to the particulars unaltered, continue in full force. Wherefore, the municipal or common laws of England are, generally speaking, of no force or validity in Scotland, and, of consequence, in the ensuing commentaries, we shall have very little occasion to mention, any further than sometimes by way of illustration, the municipal laws of that part of the United Kingdoms. The town of Berwick upon Tweed, though subject to the crown of England ever since the conquest of it in the reign of Edward the Fourth, is not part of the kingdom of England, nor subject to the common law, though it is subject to all acts of Parliament, being represented by burgesses therein, and therefore it was declared by statute, 20 George II, chapter 42, that where England only is mentioned in any act of Parliament, the same notwithstanding shall be deemed to comprehend the dominion of Wales and the town of Berwick upon Tweed. But the general law there used is the Scots law, and the ordinary process of the courts of Westminster Hall is there of no authority. As to Ireland, that is still a distinct kingdom, though a dependent, subordinate kingdom. It was only entitled the Dominion or Lordship of England, and the king's style was no other than Dominus Ibernie, Lord of England, till the thirty-third year of King Henry the Eighth, when he assumed the title of king, which is recognized by Act of Parliament, 35, Henry the Eighth, Chapter 3. But, as Scotland and England are now one and the same kingdom, and yet differ in their municipal laws, so England and Ireland are, on the other hand, distinct kingdoms, and yet in general agree in their laws. The inhabitants of Ireland are, for the most part, descended from the English, who planted it as a kind of colony, after the conquest of it by King Henry the Second, at which time they carried over the English laws along with them. And as Ireland, thus conquered, planted, and governed, still continues in a state of dependence, it must necessarily conform to and be obliged by such laws as the superior state thinks proper to prescribe. At the time of this conquest, the Irish were governed by what they called the Brehan Law, so styled from the Irish name of judges, who were denominated Brehans. But King John, in the twelfth year of his reign, went into Ireland, and carried over with him many able sages of the law, and there, by his letters patent, in right of the dominion of conquest, is said to have ordained and established that Ireland shall be governed by the laws of England. Which letters patent, Sir Edward Cook apprehends to have been there confirmed in Parliament. But, to this ordinance, many of the Irish were averse to conform, and still stuck to their Brehan law, so that both Henry the Third and Edward the First were obliged to renew the injunction, and at length, in a Parliament holden at Kilkenny, forty Edward the Third, under Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the then Lieutenant of England, the Brehan Law was formally abolished, it being unanimously declared to be indeed no law, but a lewd custom crept in of later times. And yet, even in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the wild natives still kept and preserved their Brehan law, which is described to have been, quote, a rule of right unwritten, but delivered by tradition from one to another, in which oftentimes there appeared great shew of equity in determining the right between party and party, but in many things repugnant quite both to God's law and man's. End quote the latter part of which character is alone allowed it, under Edward I and his grandson. 
But, as Ireland was a distinct dominion, and had parliaments of its own, it is to be observed that though the immemorial customs, or common law, of England were made the rule of justice in Ireland also, yet no act of the English parliament, since the twelfth of King John, extended into that kingdom, unless it were specially named, or included under general words, such as, quote, within any of the king's dominions, end quote and this is particularly expressed, and the reason given in the year-book, Ireland hath a parliament of its own, and maketh and altereth laws, and our statutes do not bind them, because they do not send representatives to our parliament, but their persons are the king's subjects, like as the inhabitants of Calais, Gascony, and Guyenne, which they continued under the king's subjection, End quote. The method made use of in England, as stated by Sir Edward Cook, of making statutes in their parliaments, according to Poyning's law, of which hereafter is this. 1. The Lord Lieutenant and Council of Ireland must certify to the King under the Great Seal of Ireland the acts proposed to be passed. 2. The King and Council of England are to consider, approve, alter, or reject the said acts, and certify them back again under the great seal of England, and then, three, they are to be proposed, received, or rejected in the Parliament of Ireland. By this means nothing was left to the Parliament of England, but a bare negative or power of rejecting, not of proposing any law. But the usage now is that bills are often framed in either house of Parliament under the denomination of heads for a bill or bills, and in that shape they are offered to the consideration of the Lord Lieutenant and Privy Council, who then reject them at pleasure, without transmitting them to England. But the Irish nation, being excluded from the benefits of the English statutes, were deprived of many good and profitable laws, made for the improvement of the common law, and the measure of justice in both kingdoms becoming thereby no longer uniform. Therefore, in the tenth year of Henry the Seventh, a set of statutes passed in Ireland, Sir Edward Poynings being then Lord Deputy, whence it is called Poynings' Law, by which it was, among other things, enacted, that all acts of Parliament before made in England should be of force within the realm of Ireland. But, by the same rule that no laws made in England, between King John's time and Poyning's law, were then binding in Ireland, it follows that no acts of the English Parliament made since the tenth year of Henry the Seventh do now bind the people of Ireland unless specially named or included under general words. And on the other hand, it is equally clear that where Ireland is particularly named, or is included under general words, they are bound by such acts of Parliament. For this follows from the very nature and constitution of a dependent state. Dependence being very little else, but an obligation to conform to the will or law of that superior person or state, upon which the inferior depends. The original and true ground of this superiority is the right of conquest, a right allowed by the law of nations, if not by that of nature, and founded upon a compact either expressly or tacitly made between the conqueror and the conquered that if they will acknowledge the victor for their master, he will treat them for the future as subject, and not as enemies. But this state of dependence being almost forgotten, and ready to be disputed by the Irish nation, it became necessary some years ago to declare how that matter really stood, and therefore, by the statute 6, George I, chapter 5, it is declared that the kingdom of Ireland 
ought to be subordinate to and dependent upon the imperial crown of Great Britain, as being inseparably united thereto, and that the King's Majesty, with the consent of the Lords and Commons of Great Britain in Parliament, has power to make laws to bind the people of Ireland. Thus we see how extensively the laws of Ireland communicate with those of England, and indeed such communication is highly necessary, as the ultimate resort from the courts of justice in England is, as in Wales, to those in England, a writ of error, in the nature of an appeal, lying from the king's bench in Ireland to the king's bench in England, as the appeal from all other courts in England lies immediately to the House of Lords here. It being expressly declared, by the same statute, 6 George I, Chapter 5, that the peers of Ireland have no jurisdiction to affirm or reverse any judgments or decrees whatsoever. This propriety, and even necessity, in all inferior dominions, of this Constitution, quote, that, though justice be in general administered by courts of their own, yet that the appeal in the last resort ought to be to the courts of the superior state, end quote, is founded upon these two reasons. 1. Because otherwise the law, appointed or permitted to such inferior dominion, might be insensibly changed within itself, without the assent of the superior. 2. Because otherwise judgments might be given to the disadvantage or diminution of the superiority, or to make the dependence to be only of the person of the king, and not of the crown of England. With regard to the other adjacent islands, which are subject to the crowns of Great Britain, some of them, as the Isle of Wight, of Portland, of Thanet, etc., are comprised within some neighboring county, and are therefore to be looked upon as annexed to the mother island, and part of the kingdom of England. But there are others which require a more particular consideration. And first, the Isle of Man is a distinct territory from England, and is not governed by our laws, neither does any act of Parliament extend to it, unless it be particularly named therein. And then, an act of Parliament is binding there. It was formerly a subordinate feudatory kingdom, subject to the kings of Norway, then to King John and Henry the Third of England, afterwards to the kings of Scotland, and then again to the crown of England, and, at length, we find King Henry the Fourth claiming the island by right of conquest, and disposing of it to the Earl of Northumberland, upon whose attainder it was granted, by the name of the Lordship of Man, to Sir John de Stanley, by letters patent, 7, Henry the Fourth. In his lineal descendants it continued for eight generations, till the death of Ferdinando, Earl of Derby, A.D. 1594, when a controversy arose concerning the inheritance thereof, between his daughters and William, his surviving brother, upon which, in a doubt that was started concerning the validity of the original patent, the island was seized into the Queen's hands, and afterwards various grants were made of it by King James I, all which being expired or surrendered, it was granted afresh in seven James I to William Earl of Derby and the heirs male of his body, with remainder to his heirs general, which grant was the next year confirmed by Act of Parliament, with a restraint of the power of alienation by the said Earl and his issue male. On the death of James Earl of Derby, A.D. 1735, the male line of Earl William failing, the Duke of Athol succeeded to the island as heir-general by a female branch. In the meantime, though the title of king has long been disused, the earls of Derby, as lords of man, had remained a sort of royal authority therein, by assenting or dissenting to laws, and exercising an appellate jurisdiction. Yet, though no English writ or process from the courts of Westminster 
was of any authority in man, an appeal lay from a decree of the lord of the island to the king of Great Britain in council. But the distinct jurisdiction of this little subordinate royalty being found inconvenient for the purposes of public justice and for the revenue, it affording a convenient asylum for debtors, outlaws, and smugglers, authority was given to the treasury by statute 12, George I, chapter 28, to purchase the interest of the then proprietors for the use of the crown, which purchase has at length been completed in this present year, 1765, and confirmed by statutes 5, George III, chapter 26 and 39, whereby the whole island and all its dependencies, so granted as aforesaid, except the landed property of the Athol family, their manorial rights and emoluments, and the patronage of the bishopric, and other ecclesiastical benefices, are unalienably vested in the crown, and subjected to the regulations of the British excise and customs. The islands of Jersey, Guernsey, Sark, Alderney, and their appendages, were parcel of the Duchy of Normandy, and were united to the crown of England by the first princes of the Norman line. They are governed by their own laws, which are for the most part the ducal customs of Normandy, being collected in an ancient book of very great authority, intitulated Le Grand Costumier. The king's writ, or process from the courts of Westminster, is therefore of no force, but his commission is. They are not bound by common acts of our Parliament, unless particularly named. All causes are originally determined by their own officers, the bailiffs and jurists of the islands, but an appeal lies from them to the king in council in the last resort. Besides these adjacent islands, our more distant plantations in America and elsewhere are also in some respects subject to the English laws. Plantations or colonies in distant countries are either such where the lands are claimed by right of occupancy only, by finding them desert and uncultivated, and peopling them from the mother country, or where, when already cultivated, they have been either gained by conquest or ceded to us by treaties. And both these rights are found upon the law of nature, or at least upon that of nations. But there is a difference between these two species of colonies with respect to the laws by which they are bound, for it is held that if an uninhabited country be discovered and planted by English subjects, all the English laws are immediately there in force. For as the law is the birthright of every subject, so wherever they go, they carry their laws with them. But in conquered or ceded countries, that have already laws of their own, the king may indeed alter and change those laws, but, till he does actually change them, the ancient laws of the country remain, unless such as are against the law of God, as in the case of an infidel country. End of section 11 Section 12, Part 2 of Section 4 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book 1. Introduction. Section 4. Part 2. Our American plantations are principally of this latter sort being obtained in the last century, either by right of conquest and driving out the natives, with what natural justice I shall not at present inquire, or by treaties. And therefore the common law of England, as such, has no allowance or authority there, they being no part of the mother country, but distinct, though dependent, dominions. They are subject, however, 
to the control of the Parliament, though, like Ireland, man, and the rest, not bound by any acts of Parliament, unless particularly named. The form of government in most of them is borrowed from that of England. They have a governor named by the king, or in some proprietary colonies by the proprietor, who is his representative or deputy. They have courts of justice of their own, from whose decisions an appeal lies to the king in council here in England. Their assemblies, which are their house of commons, together with their council of state being their upper house, with the concurrence of the king or his representative, the governor, make laws suited to their own emergencies. But it is particularly declared by statute 7 and 8, William the Third, chapter 22, that all laws, by-laws, usages, and customs, which shall be in practice in any of the plantations, repugnant to any law made or to be made in this kingdom, relative to the said plantations, shall be utterly void and of non-effect. These are the several parts of the dominions of the crown of Great Britain, in which the municipal laws of England are not of force or authority, merely as the municipal laws of England. Most of them have probably copied the spirit of their own law from this original, but then it receives its obligation and authoritative force from being the law of the country. As to any foreign dominions which may belong to the person of the king by hereditary descent, by purchase, or other acquisition, as the territory of Hanover, and his majesty's other property in Germany, as these do not in any wise appertain to the crown of these kingdoms, they are entirely unconnected with the laws of England, and do not communicate with this nation in any respect whatsoever. The English legislature had wisely remarked the inconvenience that had formerly resulted from dominions on the continent of Europe, from the Norman territory which William the Conqueror brought with him, and held in conjunction with the English throne, and from Anjou and its appendages, which fell to Henry the Second by hereditary descent. They had seen the nation engaged in near four hundred years together in ruinous wars for defense of these foreign dominions, till happily for this country they were lost under the reign of Henry the Sixth. They observed that from that time the maritime interests of England were better understood and more clearly pursued, that, in consequence of this attention, the nation, as soon as she had rested from her civil wars, began at this period to flourish all at once, and became much more considerable in Europe than when her princes were possessed of a larger territory and her councils distracted by foreign interests. The experience and these considerations gave birth to a conditional clause in the Act of Settlement, which vested in the Crown, in his present Majesty's illustrious house, quote, that in case the Crown and imperial dignity of this realm shall hereafter come to any person not being a native of this kingdom of England, this nation shall not be obliged to engage in any war for the defence of any dominions or territories which do not belong to the Crown of England, without consent of Parliament. End quote. We come now to consider the Kingdom of England in particular, the direct and immediate subject of those laws, concerning which we are to treat in the ensuing commentaries. And this comprehends not only Wales, of which enough has been already said, but also part of the sea. The main or high seas are part of the realm of England, for thereon our courts of admiralty have jurisdiction, as will be shown hereafter, but they are not subject to the common law. This main sea begins at the low water mark, but between the high water mark and the low water mark, where the sea ebbs and flows, the common law and the admiralty have divisum imperium, an alternate jurisdiction, upon the water, when it is full sea, the other upon the land when it is an ebb. The territory of England is liable to two divisions, the one ecclesiastical, the other civil. 1. The ecclesiastical division is, primarily, into two provinces, 
those of Canterbury and York. A province is the circuit of an archbishop's jurisdiction. Each province contains diverse dioceses, or sees, of suffragan bishops, whereof Canterbury includes twenty-one, and York three. Besides the bishopric of the Isle of Man, which was annexed to the province of York by King Henry the Eighth, every diocese is divided into archdeaconries, whereof there are sixty in all, each archdeaconry into rural deaneries, which are the circuit of the archdeacons and rural deans' jurisdiction, of whom hereafter, and every deanery, is divided into parishes. A parish is that circuit of ground in which the souls under the care of one parson or vicar do inhabit. These are computed to be near ten thousand in number. How ancient the division of parishes is may at present be difficult to ascertain, for it seems to be agreed on all hands that in the early ages of Christianity in this island parishes were unknown, or at least signified the same that the diocese does now. There was then no appropriation of ecclesiastical dues to any particular church, but every man was at liberty to contribute his tithes to whatever priest or church he pleased, provided only that he did it to some, or, if he made no special appointment or appropriation thereof, they were paid into the hands of the bishop, whose duty it was to distribute them among the clergy, and for other pious purposes, according to his own discretion. Mr. Camden says England was divided into parishes by Archbishop Honorius about the year 630. Sir Henry Hobart lays it down that parishes were first erected by the Council of Lecheren, which was held A.D. 1179, each wildly differing from the other, and both of them perhaps from the truth, which will probably be found in the medium between the two extremes. For Mr. Selden has clearly shown that the clergy lived in common without any division of parishes long after the time mentioned by Camden, and it appears from the Saxon laws that parishes were in being long before the date of that council of Lecheren, to which they are ascribed by Hobart. We find the distinction of parishes, nay, even of mother churches, so early as in the laws of King Edgar, about the year 970. Before that time, the consecration of tithes was in general arbitrary, that is, every man paid his own, as was before observed, to what church or parish he pleased, but this being liable to be attended with either fraud, or at least caprice, in the person's paying, and with either jealousies or mean compliances, in such as were competitors for receiving them, it was now ordered, by the law of King Edgar, that, quote, Dentur omnes de simae primerie ecclesiae ad quam parotia pertinet, end quote. However, if any sane or great lord had a church within his own demesnes, distinct from the mother church, in the nature of a private chapel, then, provided such church had a cemetery or consecrated place of burial belonging to it, he might allot one-third of his tithes for the maintenance of the officiating minister. But, if it had no cemetery, the thane must himself have maintained his chaplain by some other means, for in such case all his tithes were ordained to be paid to the primerie ecclesiae, or mother church. This proves that the kingdom was then universally divided into parishes, which division happened probably not all at once, but by degrees. For it seems pretty clear and certain that the boundaries of parishes were originally ascertained by those of a manor or manors, since it very seldom happens that a manor extends itself over more parishes than one, though there are often many manors in one parish. The lords, as Christianity spread itself, began to build churches upon their own demesnes or wastes to accommodate their tenants in one or two adjoining lordships, and, in order to have divine service regularly performed therein, obliged all their tenants 
to appropriate their thoughts to the maintenance of one officiating minister, instead of leaving them at liberty to distribute them among the clergy, of the diocese in general. And this tract of land, the tithes whereof were so appropriated, formed a distinct parish, which will well enough account for the frequent intermixture of parishes one with another, for if a lord had a parcel of land detached from the main of his estate, but not sufficient to form a parish of itself, it was natural to him to endow his newly erected church with the tithes of those disjoined lands, especially if no church was then built in any lordship adjoining to those outlying parcels. 2. The civil division of the territory of England is into counties. Of those counties, two hundred. Of those hundreds, into tithings, or towns, which division, as it now stands, seems to owe its original to King Alfred, who, to prevent the rapiness and disorders which formerly prevailed in the realm, instituted tithings, so called, from the Saxon, because ten freeholders with their families composed one. These all dwelt together, and were sureties, or free pledges, to the king for the good behavior of each other, and, if any offense were committed in their district, they were bound to have the offender forthcoming, and therefore, anciently, no man was suffered to abide in England above forty days, unless he were enrolled in some tithing or decenary. One of the principal inhabitants of the tithing is annually appointed to preside over the rest, being called the tithing man, the headborough, words which speak their own etymology, and in some countries the boar's holder, or borough's elder, being supposed the discreetest man in the borough, town, or tithing. Tithings, towns, or villes, are of the same signification in law, and had, each of them, originally, a church and celebration of divine service, sacraments, and burials, which to have, or have had, separate to itself, is the essential distinction of a town, according to Sir Edward Cook. The word town or ville is indeed, by the alteration of times and language, now become a generical term, comprehending under it the several species of cities, boroughs, and common towns. A city is a town incorporated, which is, or has been, the see of a bishop, and though the bishopric be dissolved, as at Westminster, yet still it remains a city. A borough is now understood to be a town, either corporate or not, that sent it burgesses to Parliament. Other towns there are, to the number, Sir Edward Cook says, of 8,803, which are neither cities nor boroughs, some of which have the privileges of markets, and others not, but both are equally towns in law. To several of these towns there are small appendages belonging, called hamlets, which are taken notice of in the statute of Exeter, which makes frequent mention of entire villes, demivilles, and hamlets. Entire villes, Sir Henry Spellman, conjectures to have consisted of ten freemen, or frank pledges, demivilles of five, and hamlets of less than five. These little collections of houses are sometimes under the same administration as the town itself, sometimes governed by separate officers, in which last case it is, to some purposes in law, looked upon as a distinct township. These towns, as was before hinted, contained each originally but one parish, and one tithing, though many of them now, by the increase of inhabitants, are divided into several parishes and tithings, and sometimes, where there is but one parish, there are two or more villes or tithings. As ten families of freeholders make up a town or a tithing, so ten tithings composed a superior division, called a hundred, as consisting of ten times ten families. The hundred is governed by a high constable or bailiff, and formerly there was regularly held in it the hundred court for the trial of causes, though now fallen into disuse. In some of the more northern counties, these hundreds are called vapentakes. The subdivision of hundreds into tithings 
seems to be most particularly the invention of Alfred. The institutions of hundreds themselves he rather introduced than invented, for they seem to have obtained in Denmark. And we find that in France a regulation of this sort was made above two hundred years before, set on foot by Clotarius and Childebert, with the view of obliging each district to answer for the robberies committed in its own division. These divisions were, in that country, as well military as civil, and each contained a hundred freemen, who were subject to an officer called the centenarius, a number of which centenarii were themselves subject to a superior officer called the count or comes. And indeed, this institution of hundreds may be traced back as far as the ancient Germans, from which were derived both the Franks, who became masters of Gaul, and the Saxons, who settled in England. For we read in Tacitus that both the thing and the name were well known to that warlike people. Quote, Centeni ex singulis pagis sunt, itque ipsum inter suos vocantur, et quod primo numerus fuit, jam nomen et honor est. Quote. An indefinite number of these hundreds make up a county or shire. Shire is a Saxon word signifying a division, but a county, comitatus, is plainly derived from comis, the count of the Franks, that is, the earl or alderman, as the Saxons called him, of the shire, to whom the government of it was entrusted. This he usually exercised by his deputy, still called in Latin vice comis, and in English the sheriff, shreve or shirereve, signifying the officer of the shire, upon whom, by process of time, the civil administration of it is now totally devolved. In some counties, the officer of the shire, upon whom, by process of time, the civil administration of it is now totally devolved. In some counties, there is an intermediate division between the shire and the hundreds, as lates in Kent and rapes in Sussex, each of them containing about three or four hundreds apiece. These had formerly had their lace reeves and rape reeves acting in subordination to the shire reeve. Where a country is divided into three of these intermediate jurisdictions, they are called trithings, which were anciently governed by a trithing reeve. These trithings still subsist in the large county of York, where, by an easy corruption, they are denominated ridings, the north, the east, and the west riding. The number of counties in England and Wales have been different at different times. At present, there are forty in England and twelve in Wales. Three of these counties, Chester, Durham, and Lancaster, are called counties Palatine. The two former are such by prescription, or immemorial custom, or at least as old as the Norman conquest. The latter was created by King Edward the Third, in favor of Henry Plantagenet, first Earl and then Duke of Lancaster, whose heiress, John of Ghent, the King's son, had married, and afterwards confirmed in Parliament to honor John of Ghent himself, whom, on the death of his father-in-law, he had also created Duke of Lancaster. Counties Palatine are so called a palatio, because of the towns thereof. The Earl of Chester, the Bishop of Durham, and the Duke of Lancaster, had in those counties jura regalia, as fully as the king hath in his palace, regalem potestatem in omnibus, as Bracton expresses it. They might pardon treasons, murders, and felonies. They appointed all judges and justices of the peace. All writs and indictments ran in their names, as in other counties in the king's, and all offences were said to be done against their peace, and not, as in other places, contra passem domini regis. And indeed, by the ancient law, in all peculiar jurisdictions, offences were said to be done against his peace, in whose court they were tried, in a court leet, 
contra passem domini, in the court of a corporation, contra passem valivorum, in the sheriff's court, or torn, contra passem vice comitis. These palatine privileges were in all probability originally granted to the counties of Chester and Durham, because they bordered upon enemy countries, Wales and Scotland, in order that the owners, being encouraged by so large an authority, might be the more watchful in its defence, and that the inhabitants, having justice administered at home, might not be obliged to go out of the county and leave it open to the enemy's incursions. And upon this account, also, there were formerly two other counties palatine, Pembrokeshire and Herxhamshire, the latter now united with Northumberland, but these were abolished by Parliament, the former in 27 Henry VIII, the latter in 14 Elizabeth, and in 27 Henry III, likewise, the powers before mentioned of owners of counties palatine were abridged. The reason for their continuance in a manner ceasing, though still all writs are witnessed in their names, and all forfeitures for treason by the common law accrue to them. Of these three, the county of Durham is now the only one remaining in the hands of a subject, for the earldom of Chester, as Camden testifies, was united to the crown by Henry the Third, and has ever since given title to the king's eldest son, and the county palatine, or duchy, of Lancaster was the property of Henry of Bolingbroke, the son of John of Grant, at the same time when he wrested the crown from King Richard the Second, and assumed the title of Henry the Fourth. But he was too prudent to suffer this to be united to the crown, lest, if he lost one, he should lose the other also. For, as Plowden and Sir Edward Cook observed, quote, he knew he had the duty of Lancaster by sure and indefeasible title, but that his title to the crown was not so assured, for that after the decease of Richard the Second, the right of the crown was in the heir of Launa Duke of Clarence, second son of Edward the Third, John of Ghent, father to this Henry the Fourth, being but the fourth son, and therefore he procured an act of Parliament in the first year of his reign to keep it distinct and separate from the crown, and so it descended to his son and grandson, Henry the Fifth and Henry the Sixth. Henry the Sixth being attained in one Edward the Fourth, this duty was declared in Parliament to have become forfeited to the crown, and at the same time an act was made to keep it still distinct and separate from the other inheritances of the crown, and in one Henry the Seventh, another act was made to vest the inheritance thereof in Henry the Seventh and his heirs, and in this state, say Sir Edward Cook and Lambert, viz., in the natural heirs or posterity of Henry the Seventh, did the right of the duchy remain in their days, a separate and distinct inheritance from that of the crown of England. The Isle of Ely is not a county palatine, though sometimes erroneously called so, but only a royal franchise, the bishop having, by grant of King Henry I, jura regalia within the Isle of Ely, and thereby he exercises a jurisdiction over all causes, as well criminal as civil. There are also counties corporate, which are certain cities and towns, some with more, some with less territory annexed to them, to which out of special grace and favour the kings of England have granted to be counties of themselves, and not to be comprised in any other county, but to be governed by their own sheriffs and other magistrates, so that no officers of the county at large have any power to intermeddle therein. Such are London, York, Bristol, Norwich, Coventry, and many others, and thus much of the country subject to the laws of England. End of section 12Part 1 of Chapter 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simum. Commentaries on the Laws of England. Book the First. Of the Rights of Persons. Chapter the First. Of the Absolute Rights of Individuals. The objects of the laws of England are so very numerous and extensive that, in order to consider them with any tolerable ease and perspicuity, it will be necessary to distribute them methodically, under proper and distinct heads, avoiding as much as possible divisions too large and comprehensive on the one hand, and too trifling and minute on the other, both of which are equally productive of confusion. Now, as municipal law is a rule of civil conduct, commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong, or, as Cicero, and after him our Bracton, has expressed it, sanctio justa, gibens honesta, et prohibens contraria, it follows that the primary and principal objects of the law are rights and wrongs. In the prosecution, therefore, of these commentaries, I shall follow this very simple and obvious division, and shall in the first place consider the rights that are commanded, and secondly the wrongs that are forbidden by the laws of England. Rights are, however, liable to another subdivision, being either first those which concern and are annexed to the persons of men, and are then called jura personarum, or the rights of persons, or they are, secondly, such as a man may acquire over external objects, or things unconnected with his person, which are styled iura reum, or the rights of things. Wrongs also are divisible into, first, private wrongs, which, being an infringement merely of particular rights, concern individuals only, and are called civil injuries, and, secondly, public wrongs, which, being a breach of general and public rights, affect the whole community, and are called crimes and misdemeanors. The objects of the laws of England falling into this fourfold division, the present commentaries will therefore consist of the four following parts. 1 the rights of persons, with the means whereby such rights may be either acquired or lost. 2. The rights of things, with the means also of acquiring and losing them. 3. Private wrongs, or civil injuries, with the means of redressing them by law. 4. Public wrongs, or crimes and misdemeanors, with the means of prevention and punishment. We are now first to consider the rights of persons, with the means of acquiring and losing them. Now the rights of persons that are commanded to be observed by the municipal law are of two sorts. First, such as are due from every citizen, which are usually called civil duties, and secondly, such as belong to him, which is the more popular acceptation of rights or iure. Both may indeed be comprised in this latter division, for, as all social duties are of a relative nature, at the same time that they are due from one man or set of men, they must also be due to another. But I apprehend it will be more clear and easy to consider many of them as duties required from, rather than as rights belonging to, particular persons. Thus, for instance, allegiance is usually, and therefore most easily, considered as the duty of the people, and protection as the duty of the magistrate. And yet they are, reciprocally, the rights as well as duties of each other. Allegiance is the right of the magistrate, and protection the right of the people. Persons also are divided by the law into either natural persons or artificial. Natural persons are such as the god of nature formed us. Artificial are such as created and devised by human laws for the purposes of society and government, which are called corporations or bodies politic. The rights of persons considered in their natural capacities are also of two sorts, absolute and relative. Absolute, which are such as appertain and belong to particular men merely as individuals or single persons. Relative, which are incident to them as members of society, and standing in various relations to each other. The first, that is, absolute rights, will be the subject of the present chapter. By the absolute rights of individuals we mean those which are so in their primary and strictest sense such as would belong to their persons merely in a state of nature, and which every man is entitled to enjoy whether out of society or in it. But with regard to the absolute duties which man is bound to perform, considered as a mere individual, it is not to be expected that any human municipal laws should at all explain or enforce them. 
for the end and intent of such laws being only to regulate the behaviour of mankind as they are members of society and stand in various relations to each other they have consequently no business or concern with any but social or relative duties let a man therefore be ever so abandoned in his principles or vicious in his practice provided he keeps his wickedness to himself and does not offend against the rules of public decency he is out of the reach of human laws but if he makes his vices public though they be such as seem principally to affect himself as drunkenness or the like they then become by the bad example they set of pernicious effects to society and therefore it is then the business of human laws to correct them here the circumstance of publication is what alters the nature of the case public sobriety is a relative duty and therefore enjoined by our laws private sobriety is an absolute duty which whether it be performed or not human tribunals can never know and therefore they can never enforce it by any civil sanction but with respect to rights the case is different human laws define and enforce as well those rights which belong to a man considered as an individual as those which belong to him considered as related to others for the principal aim of society is to protect individuals in the enjoyment of those absolute rights which were vested in them by the immutable laws of nature but which could not be preserved in peace without that mutual assistance and intercourse which is gained by the institution of friendly and social communities hence it follows that the first and primary end of human laws is to maintain and regulate these absolute rights of individuals such rights as are social and relative result from and are posterior to the formation of states and societies so that to maintain and regulate these is clearly a subsequent consideration and therefore the principal view of human laws is or ought always to be to explain protect and enforce such rights as are absolute which in themselves are few and simple and then such rights as are relative which arising from a variety of connections will be far more numerous and more complicated these will take up a greater space in any code of laws and hence may appear to be more attended to though in reality they are not than the rights of the former kind let us therefore proceed to examine how far all laws ought and how far the laws of england actually do take notice of these absolute rights and provide for their lasting security the absolute rights of man, considered as a free agent, endowed with discernment to know good from evil, and with power of choosing those measures which appear to him to be most desirable, are usually summed up in one general appellation, and denominated the natural liberty of mankind. This natural liberty consists properly in a power of acting as one thinks fit, without any restraint or control, unless by the law of nature being a right inherent in us by birth and one of the gifts of god to man at his creation when he endued him with the faculty of free will but every man when he enters into society gives up a part of his natural liberty as the price of so valuable a purchase and in consideration of receiving the advantages of mutual commerce obliges himself to conform to those laws which the community has thought proper to establish and this species of legal obedience and conformity is infinitely more desirable than that wild and savage liberty which is sacrificed to obtain it for no man that considers a moment would wish to retain the absolute and uncontrolled power of doing whatever he pleases the consequence of which is that every other man would also have the same power and then there would be no security to individuals in any of the enjoyments of life political therefore or civil liberty which is that of a member of society is no other than natural liberty so far restrained by human laws and no farther as is necessary and expedient for the general advantage of the public hence we may collect that the law which restrains a man from doing mischief to his fellow-citizens though it diminishes the natural increases the civil liberty of mankind but every wanton and causeless restraint of the will of the subject, whether practised by a monarch, a nobility, or a popular assembly, is a degree of tyranny. Nay, that even laws themselves, whether made with or without our consent, if they regulate and constrain our conduct in matters of mere indifference, without any good end in view, are laws destructive of liberty. 
whereas if any public advantage can arise from observing such precepts, the control of our private inclinations, in one or two particular points, will conduce to preserve our general freedom in others of more importance, by supporting that state of society which alone can secure our independence. Thus the statute of King Edward the Fourth, which forbade the fine gentlemen of those times, under the degree of a lord, to wear pikes upon their shoes or boots of more than two inches in length, was a law that savoured of oppression, because, however ridiculous the fashion then in use might appear, the restraining it by pecuniary penalties could serve no purpose of common utility. But the statute of King Charles the Second, which prescribes a thing seemingly as indifferent, that is, a dress for the dead, who are all ordered to be buried in woollen, is a law consistent with public liberty, for it encourages the staple trade, on which in great measure depends the universal good of the nation, so that laws, when prudently framed, are by no means subversive, but rather introductive of liberty. For, as Mr. Locke has well observed, where there is no law, there is no freedom. But then, on the other hand, that constitution or frame of government, that system of laws, is alone calculated to maintain civil liberty, which leaves the subject entire master of his own conduct, except in those points wherein the public good requires some direction or restraint. The idea and practice of this political or civil liberty flourish in their highest vigour in these kingdoms where it falls little short of perfection, and can only be lost or destroyed by the folly or demerits of its owner, the legislator and of course the laws of England being peculiarly adapted to the preservation of this inestimable blessing even in the meanest subject. Very different from the modern constitutions of other states, on the continent of Europe and from the genius of the imperial law, which in general are calculated to vest an arbitrary and despotic power of controlling the actions of the subject in the prince or in a few grandees. And this spirit of liberty is so deeply implanted in our constitution, and rooted even in our very soil, that a slave or a negro, the moment he lands in England, falls under the protection of the laws, and with regard to all natural rights, becomes eo instanti a free man. The absolute rights of every Englishman, which, taken in a political and extensive sense, are usually called their liberties, as they are founded on nature and reason, so they are coeval with our form of government, though subject at times to fluctuate and change, their establishment, excellent as it is, being still human. At some times we have seen them depressed by overbearing and tyrannical princes, at others so luxuriant as even to tend to anarchy, a worse state than tyranny itself, as any government is better than none at all. But the vigour of our free constitution has always delivered the nation from these embarrassments, and, as soon as the convulsions consequent on the struggle have been over, the balance of our rights and liberties has settled to its proper level, and their fundamental articles have been from time to time asserted in Parliament, as often as they were thought to be in danger. First, by the great charter of liberties, which was obtained sword in hand from King John and afterwards, with some alterations, confirmed in Parliament by King Henry the Third, his son. Which charter contained very few new grants, but, as Sir Edward Coke observes, was for the most part declaratory of the principal grants of the fundamental laws of England. Afterwards, by the statute called Confirmatio Carterum, whereby the great charter is directed to be allowed as the common law, all judgments contrary to it are declared void. Copies of it are ordered to be sent to all cathedral churches, and read twice a year to the people. And sentence of excommunication is directed to be as constantly denounced against all those that by word, deed, or counsel act contrary thereto, or in any degree infringe it. Next, by a multitude of subsequent corroborating statutes, Sir Edward Coke, I think, reckons thirty-two, from the first Edward to Henry the Fourth. Then, after a long interval, by the Petition of Right, which was a parliamentary declaration of the liberties of the people, assented to by King Charles I in the beginning of his reign, which was closely followed by the still more ample concessions made by that unhappy prince to his parliament before the fatal rupture between them, and by the many salutary laws, particularly the Habeas Corpus Act, passed under Charles II. To these succeeded the Bill of Rights, 
or declaration delivered by the lords and commons to the prince and princess of orange thirteen february sixteen eighty eight and afterwards enacted in parliament when they became king and queen which declaration concludes in these remarkable words quote, and they do claim demand and insist upon all and singular the premises as their undoubted rights and liberties End quote. and the act of parliament itself recognizes quote, all and singular the rights and liberties asserted and claimed in the said declaration to be the true ancient and indubitable rights of the people of this kingdom End quote. lastly these liberties were again asserted at the commencement of the present century in the act of settlement whereby the crown is limited to his present majesty's illustrious house and some new provisions were added at the same fortunate era for a better securing our religion laws and liberties which the statute declares to be quote, the birthright of the people of england end quote, according to the ancient doctrine of the common law thus much for the declaration of our rights and liberties the rights themselves thus defined by these several statutes consist in a number of private immunities which will appear from what has been premised to be indeed no other than either that residuum of natural liberty which is not required by the laws of society to be sacrificed to public convenience or else those civil privileges which society hath engaged to provide in lieu of the natural liberties so given up by individuals these therefore were formerly either by inheritance or purchase the rights of all mankind but in most other countries of the world being now more or less debased and destroyed they at present may be said to remain in a peculiar and emphatical manner the rights of the people of england and these may be reduced to three principal or primary articles the right of personal security the right of personal liberty and the right of private property because as there is no other known method of compulsion or of abridging man's natural free will but by an infringement or diminution of one or other of these important rights the preservation of these inviolate may justly be said to include the preservation of our civil immunities in their largest and most extensive sense roman numeral one the right of personal security consists in a person's legal and uninterrupted enjoyment of his life his limbs his body his health and his reputation one life is the immediate gift of god a right inherent by nature in every individual and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as an infant is able to stir in the mother's womb for if a woman is quick with child and by a potion or otherwise killeth it in her womb or if any one beat her whereby the child dieth in her body and she is delivered of a dead child this though not murder was by the ancient law homicide or manslaughter but at present it is not looked upon in quite so atrocious a light though it remains a very heinous misdemeanor an infant in ventre sa mère or in mother's womb is supposed in law to be born for many purposes it is capable of having a legacy or a surrender of a copyhold estate made to it it may have a guardian assigned to it and it is enabled to have an estate limited to its use and to take afterwards by such limitation as if it were then actually born and in this point the civil law agrees with ours two a man's limbs by which for the present we only understand those members which may be useful to him in fight and the loss of which only amounts to mayhem by the common law are also the gift of the wise creator to enable man to protect himself from external injuries in a state of nature to these therefore he has a natural inherent right and they cannot be wantonly destroyed or disabled without a manifest breach of civil liberty both the life and limbs of a man are of such high value in the estimation of the law of england that it pardons even homicide if committed se defendendo or in order to preserve them for whatever is done by a man to save either life or member is looked upon as done upon the highest necessity and compulsion therefore if a man through fear of death or mayhem is prevailed upon to execute a deed or do any other legal act these though accompanied with all other the requisite solemnities are totally void in law if forced upon him by a well-grounded apprehension of losing his life or even his limbs in case of his non-compliance 
and the same is also a sufficient excuse for the commission of many misdemeanors, as will appear in the fourth book. The constraint a man is under in these circumstances is called in law duress, from the Latin duritias, of which there are two sorts, duress of imprisonment, where a man actually loses his liberty, of which we shall presently speak, and duress per minas, where the hardship is only threatened and impending, which is that we are now discoursing of. Duress per minas is either for fear of loss of life, or else for fear of mayhem, or loss of limb, and this fear must be upon sufficient reason. None, as Bracton expresses it, quote, suspicio cuius libet vani et meticulosi hominis, sed talis qui possit cadere in virum constantem, talis enem debet esemetus, qui in se continuat vitae periculum aut corporis cruciatum. A fear of battery or being beaten, though never so well grounded, is no duress, neither is the fear of having one's house burned or one's goods taken away and destroyed, because in these cases, should the threat be performed, a man may have satisfaction by recovering equivalent damages, but no suitable atonement can be made for the loss of life or limb, and the indulgence shewn to a man under this, the principal sort of duress, the fear of losing his life or limbs, agrees also with that maxim of the civil law. Egnositur e qui sanguinem sum qualiter qualiter redemptum voluit. The law not only regards life and member, and protects every man in the enjoyment of them, but also furnishes him with everything necessary for their support. For there is no man so indigent or wretched, but he may demand a supply sufficient for all the necessities of life from the more opulent part of the community, by means of the several statutes enacted for the relief of the poor, of which, in their proper places. A humane provision, yet, though dictated by the principles of society, this countenanced by the Roman laws. For the edicts of the Emperor Constantine, commanding the public to maintain the children of those who were unable to provide for them, in order to prevent the murder and exposure of infants, an institution founded on the same principles as our foundling hospitals, though comprised in the Theodosian Code, were rejected in Justinian's collection. These rights of life and member can only be determined by the death of the person, which is either a civil or natural death. The civil death commences if any man be banished the realm by the process of the common law, or enters into religion, that is, goes into a monastery, and becomes there a monk professed, in which cases he is absolutely dead in law, and his next heir shall have his estate. For such banished man is entirely cut off from society, and such a monk, upon his profession, renounces solemnly all secular concerns. And besides, as the popish clergy claimed an exemption from the duties of civil life, and the commands of the temporal magistrate, the genius of the English law would not suffer those persons to enjoy the benefits of society who secluded themselves from it, and refused to submit to its regulations. Footnote. This was also a rule in the feudal law. End footnote. A monk is therefore accounted civiliter motus, and when he enters into religion may, like other dying men, make his testament and executors or, if he makes none, the ordinary may grant administration to his next of kin, as if he were actually dead intested. And such executors and administrators shall have the same power, and may bring the same actions for debts due to the religious, and are liable to the same actions for those due from him, as if he were naturally deceased. Nay, so far has this principle been carried, that when one was bound in a bond to an abbot and his successors, and afterwards made his executors, and professed himself a monk of the same abbey, and in process of time was himself made abbot thereof, here the law gave him, in the capacity of abbot, an action of debt against his own executors to recover the money due. In short, a monk or religious is so effectually dead in law, that a lease made even to a third person during the life, generally, of one who afterwards becomes a monk, determines by such his entry into religion. For which reason leases and other conveyances for life are usually made to have and to hold for the term of one's natural life. The natural life being, as was before observed, the immediate donation of the great Creator, 
cannot legally be disposed of or destroyed by any individual, neither by the person himself, nor by any other of his fellow creatures, merely upon their own authority. Yet, nevertheless, it may, by the divine permission, be frequently forfeited for the breach of those laws of society which are enforced by the sanction of capital punishments, of the nature, restrictions, expedients, and legality of which we may hereafter more conveniently inquire in the concluding book of these commentaries. At present I shall only observe that whenever the constitution of a state vests in any man or body of men a power of destroying at pleasure, without the direction of laws, the lives or members of the subject, such constitution is in the highest degree tyrannical, and that whenever any laws direct such destruction for light and trivial causes, such laws are likewise tyrannical, though in an inferior degree, because here the subject is aware of the danger he is exposed to, and may, by prudent caution, provide against it. The statute law of England does therefore very seldom and the common law does never inflict any punishment extending to life or limb, unless upon the highest necessity, and the constitution is an utter stranger to any arbitrary power of killing or maiming the subject without the express warrant of law. Nullus liber homo, says the great charter, quote, aliquo modo destruatur, nisi per legale judicium parium suorum aut per legem teri, end quote which words, aliquo modo destruatur, according to Sir Edward Coke, include a prohibition not only of killing and maiming, but also of torturing, to which our laws are strangers, and of every oppression by colour of an illegal authority. And it is enacted by the statute 5 Edward III, chapter 9, that no man shall be forejudged of life or limb, contrary to the great charter and the law of the land. And again, by statute 28, Edward III, chapter 3, that no man shall be put to death without being brought to answer by due process of law. 3. Besides those limbs and members that may be necessary to man in order to defend himself or annoy his enemy, the rest of his person or body is also entitled by the same natural right to security from the corporal insults of menaces, assaults, beating and wounding though such insults amount not to destruction of life or member. 4. The preservation of a man's health from such practices as may prejudice or annoy it, and 5. The security of his reputation or good name from the arts of detraction and slander are rights to which every man is entitled by reason and natural justice, since without these it is impossible to have the perfect enjoyment of any other advantage or right. But these three last articles, being of much less importance than those which have gone before, and those which are yet to come, it will suffice to have barely mentioned among the rights of persons, referring the more minute discussion of their several branches to those parts of our commentaries which treat of the infringement of these rights under the head of personal wrongs. End of Part 1 of Chapter 1 of The Absolute Rights of Individuals Part 2 of Chapter 1 of The Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book One. Chapter One of the Absolute Rights of Individuals. Part Two. Roman numeral Two. Next to personal security, the law of England regards, asserts, and preserves the personal liberty of individuals. This personal liberty consists in the power of locomotion, of changing situation, or removing one's person to whatsoever place one's own inclination may direct, without imprisonment or restraint, unless by due course of law, concerning which we may make the same observations as upon the preceding article, that it is a right strictly natural, that the laws of England have never abridged it without sufficient cause, and that in this kingdom it cannot ever be abridged at the mere discretion of the magistrate, without the explicit permission of the laws. Here again the language of the Great Charter is that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned. 
but by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. And many subsequent old statutes expressly direct that no man shall be taken or imprisoned by suggestion or petition to the king or his council, unless it be by legal indictment or the process of the common law. By the petition of right, three Charles I, it is enacted that no free man shall be imprisoned or detained without cause shewn, to which he may make answer according to law. By 16 Charles I, chapter 10, if any person be restrained of his liberty by order or decree of any illegal court, or by command of the king's majesty in person, or by warrant of the council board, or of any of the privy council, he shall, upon demand of his council, have a writ of habeas corpus, to bring his body before the court of king's bench or common pleas, who shall determine whether the cause of his commitment be just, and thereupon do as to justice shall appertain. And by 31st Charles II, Chapter 2, commonly called the Habeas Corpus Act, the methods of obtaining this writ are so plainly pointed out and enforced that so long as this statute remains unimpeached, no subject of England can be long detained in prison except in those cases in which the law requires and justifies such detainer and lest this act should be evaded by demanding unreasonable bail, or sureties for the prisoner's appearance, it is declared by 1 William and Mary Statute 2, Chapter 2, that excessive bail ought not to be required. Of great importance to the public is the preservation of this personal liberty, for if once it were left in the power of any, the highest magistrate, to imprison arbitrarily whomever he or his officers thought proper, as in France it is daily practised by the Crown, there would soon be an end of all other rights and immunities. Some have thought that unjust attacks even upon life or property, at the arbitrary will of the magistrate, are less dangerous to the commonwealth than such as are made upon the personal liberty of the subject. To bereave a man of life, or by violence to confiscate his estate, without accusation or trial, would be so gross and notorious an act of despotism, as must at once convey the alarm of tyranny throughout the whole kingdom. But confinement of the person, by secretly hurrying him to goal, where his sufferings are unknown or forgotten, is a less public, a less striking, and therefore a more dangerous engine of arbitrary government. And yet sometimes, when the state is in real danger, even this may be a necessary measure. But the happiness of our constitution is that it is not left to the executive power to determine when the danger of the state is so great as to render this measure expedient. For the Parliament only, or legislative power, whenever it sees proper, can authorize the Crown, by suspending the Habeas Corpus Act for a short and limited time, to imprison suspected persons without giving any reason for so doing. As the Senate of Rome was wont to have recourse to a dictator, a magistrate of absolute authority, when they judged the Republic in any imminent danger. The decree of the Senate, which usually preceded the nomination of this magistrate, dent operam consules, nequit res publica detrimenti capiat, was called the Senatus Consultum Ultime Necessitatis. In like manner, this experiment ought only to be tried in cases of extreme emergency, and in these the nation parts with its liberty for a while, in order to preserve it for ever. The confinement of the person, in any wise, is an imprisonment, so that the keeping a man against his will in a private house, putting him in stocks, arresting or forcibly detaining him in the street, is an imprisonment. And the law so much discourages unlawful confinement that if a man is under duress of imprisonment, which we before explained to mean a compulsion by an illegal restraint of liberty, until he seals a bond or the like, he may allege this duress and avoid the extorted bond. But if a man be lawfully imprisoned, and either to procure his discharge, or on any other fair account, seals a bond or a deed, this is not by duress of imprisonment, and he is not at liberty to avoid it. To make imprisonment lawful, it must either be by process from the courts of judicature, or by warrant from some legal officer, having authority to commit to prison, which warrant must be in writing, under the hand and seal of the magistrate and express the causes of the commitment in order to be examined into, if necessary, upon a habeas corpus. If there be no cause expressed, the gaoler is not bound to detain the prisoner. For the law judges in this respect, said Sir Edward Coke, like Festus the Roman governor, that it is unreasonable to send the prisoner and not to signify withal the crimes alleged against him. 
A natural and regular consequence of this personal liberty is that every Englishman may claim a right to abide in his own country so long as he pleases, and not to be driven from it unless by the sentence of the law. The king, indeed, by his royal prerogative, may issue out his writ ne exiat regnum, and prohibit any of his subjects from going into foreign parts without license. This may be necessary for the public service and safeguard of the commonwealth. But no power on earth, except the authority of Parliament, can send any subject of England out of the land against his will. No, not even a criminal. For exile or transportation is a punishment unknown to the common law, and wherever it is now inflicted, it is either by the choice of the criminal himself, to escape a capital punishment, or else by the express direction of some modern act of Parliament. To this purpose the Great Charter declares that no free man shall be banished, unless by the judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. And by the Habeas Corpus Act, 31 Charles II, Chapter 2, that second Magna Carta, and stable bulwark of our liberties, it is enacted that no subject of this realm, who is an inhabitant of England, Wales, or Berwick, shall be sent prisoner into Scotland, Ireland, Jersey, Guernsey, or places beyond the seas, where they cannot have the benefit and protection of the common law, but that all such imprisonments shall be illegal, that the person who shall dare to commit another contrary to this law shall be disabled from bearing any office, shall incur the penalty of a premunure, and be incapable of receiving the king's pardon, and the party suffering shall also have his private action against the person committing, and all his aiders, advisers, and abettors, and shall recover treble costs, besides his damages, which no jury shall assess at less than five hundred pounds. The law is in this respect so benignly and liberally construed for the benefit of the subject, that, though within the realm the king may command the attendance and service of all his liegemen, yet he cannot send any man out of the realm, even upon the public service. He cannot even constitute a man Lord Deputy or Lieutenant of Ireland against his will, nor make him a foreign ambassador. For this might in reality be no more than an honourable exile. Roman numeral three. The third absolute right inherent in every Englishman is that of property, which consists in the free use, enjoyment, and disposal of all his acquisitions without any control or diminution, save only by the laws of the land. The original of private property is probably founded in nature, as will be more fully explained in the second book of the ensuing commentaries, but certainly the modifications under which we at present find it, the method of conserving it in the present owner, and of translating it from man to man, are entirely derived from society, and are some of those civil advantages in exchange for which every individual has resigned a part of his natural liberty. The laws of England are therefore, in point of honour and justice, extremely watchful in ascertaining and protecting this right. Upon this principle the Great Charter has declared that no freeman shall be deceased or divested of his freehold, or of his liberties, or free customs, but by the judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land and by a variety of ancient statutes it is enacted that no man's lands or goods shall be seized into the king's hands against the great charter and the law of the land, and that no man shall be disinherited, nor put out of his franchises or freehold, unless he be duly brought to answer, and be forejudged by cause of law. And if anything be done to the contrary, it shall be redressed, and holden for none. So great, moreover, is the regard of the law for private property, that it will not authorize the least violation of it, no, not even for the general good of the whole community. If a new road, for instance, were to be made through the grounds of a private person, it might perhaps be extensively beneficial to the public, but the law permits no man or set of men to do this without consent of the owner of the land. In vain may it be urged that the good of the individual ought to yield to that of the community, for it would be dangerous to allow any private man, or even any public tribunal, to be the judge of this common good, and to decide whether it be expedient or no. Besides, the public good is in nothing more essentially interested than in the protection of every individual's private rights, as modelled by the municipal law. In this and similar cases, the legislator alone can, and indeed frequently does, interpose, and compel the individual to acquiesce. But how does it interpose and compel? not by absolutely stripping the subject of his property in an arbitrary manner, but by giving him a full identification and equivalent for the injury thereby sustained. 
the public is now considered as an individual, treating with an individual for an exchange. All that the legislator does is to oblige the owner to alienate his possessions for a reasonable price, and even this is an exertion of power which the legislator indulges with caution, and which nothing but the legislator can perform. Nor is this the only instance in which the law of the land has postponed even public necessity to the sacred and inviolable rights of private property. For no subject of England can be constrained to pay any aids or taxes, even for the defence of the realm or the support of government, but such as are imposed by his own consent, or that of his representatives in Parliament. By the statute 25 Edward I, chapter 5 and 6, it is provided that the king shall not take any aids or tasks, but by the common assent of the realm. And what that common assent is, is more fully explained by 34 Edward I, Statute 4, Chapter 1, which enacts that no talents or aid shall be taken without assent of the archbishops, bishops, earls, barons, knights, burgesses, and other freemen of the land. Footnote. See the historical introduction to the Great Charter, etc., sub anno 1297 wherein it is shewn that this statute, the Taliagio non concedendo, supposed to have been made in 34 Edward I, is in reality nothing more than a sort of translation into Latin of the Confirmatio Cartarum, 25 Edward I, which was originally published in the Norman language. End footnote. And again by 14 Edward III, Statute 2, Chapter 1, the prelates, earls, barons and commons, citizens, burgesses, and merchants, shall not be charged to make any aid, if it be not by the common assent of the great men and commons in Parliament. And as this fundamental law had been shamefully evaded under many succeeding princes, by compulsive loans and benevolences extorted without a real and voluntary consent, it was made an article in the Petition of Right, 3 Charles I, that no man shall be compelled to yield any gift, loan, or benevolence, tax or such like charge without common consent by act of parliament and lastly by the statute one william and mary statute two chapter two it is declared that levying money for or to the use of the crown by pretence of prerogative without grant of parliament or for longer time or in other manner than the same is or shall be granted is illegal in the three preceding articles we have taken a short view of the principal absolute rights which appertain to every Englishman. But in vain would these rights be declared, ascertained and protected by the dead letter of the laws, if the Constitution had provided no other method to secure their actual enjoyment. It has therefore established certain other auxiliary subordinate rights of the subject, which serve principally as barriers to protect and maintain inviolate the three great and primary rights of personal security, personal liberty, and private property. These are, 1. The constitution, powers, and privileges of Parliament, of which I shall treat at large in the ensuing chapter. 2. The limitation of the king's prerogative, by bounds so certain and notorious, that it is impossible he should exceed them without the consent of the people. Of this also I shall treat in its proper place. The former of these keeps the legislative power in due health and vigour, so as to make it improbable that laws should be enacted destructive of general liberty. The latter is a guard upon the executive power, by restraining it from acting either beyond or in contradiction to the laws that are framed and established by the other. 3. A third subordinate right of every Englishman is that of applying to the courts of justice for redress of injuries. Since the law is in England the supreme arbiter of every man's life, liberty, and property, courts of justice must at all times be open to the subject, and the law be duly administered therein. The emphatical words of Magna Carta, spoken in the person of the king, who in judgment of the law, says Sir Edward Coke, is ever present, and repeating them in all his courts, are these. Nulli vendemus, nulli negabimus, aut differemus rectum vel justitiam and therefore every subject continues the same learned author quote, for injury done to him in bonus in terris vel persona by any other subject be he ecclesiastical or temporal without any exception may take his remedy by the course of the law and have justice and right for the injury done to him freely without sale fully without any denial and speedily without delay End quote. 
It were endless to enumerate all the affirmative acts of Parliament wherein justice is directed to be done according to the law of the land, and what that law is every subject knows, or may know if he pleases, for it depends not upon the arbitrary will of any judge, but is permanent, fixed, and unchangeable, unless by authority of Parliament. I shall, however, just mention a few negative statutes, whereby abuses, perversions, or delays of justice, especially by the prerogative, are restrained. It is ordained by Magna Carta that no free man shall be outlawed, that is, put out of the protection and benefit of the laws, but according to the law of the land. By 2 Edward III, chapter 8, and 11 Richard II, chapter 10, it is enacted that no commands or letters shall be sent under the great seal or the little seal, the signet or privy seal, in disturbance of the law, or to disturb or delay common right and though such commandments should come, the judges shall not cease to do right. And by 1 William and Mary, Statute 2, Chapter 2, it is declared that the pretended power of suspending or dispensing with laws, or the execution of laws, by regal authority, without consent of Parliament, is illegal. Not only the substantial part, or judicial decisions, of the law, but also the formal part, or method of proceeding, cannot be altered but by Parliament. For if once those outworks were demolished, there would be no inlet to all manner of innovation in the body of the law itself. The King, it is true, may erect new courts of justice, but then they must proceed according to the old established forms of the common law, for which reason it is declared in the statute 16 Charles I, chapter 10, upon the dissolution of the Court of Star Chamber, that neither his majesty nor his privy council have any jurisdiction power or authority by english bill petition articles libel which were the course of proceeding in the star chamber borrowed from the civil law or by any other arbitrary way whatsoever to examine or draw into question determine or dispose of the lands or goods of any subject of this kingdom but that the same ought to be tried and determined in the ordinary courts of justice and by course of law 4. If there should happen any uncommon injury or infringement of the rights before mentioned, which the ordinary course of law is too defective to reach, there still remains a fourth subordinate right appertaining to every individual, namely, the right of petitioning the King or either House of Parliament for the redress of grievances. In Russia we are told that the Tsar Peter established a law that no subject might petition the throne till he had first petitioned two different ministers of state. In case he obtained justice from neither, he might then present a third petition to the prince, but upon pain of death if found to be in the wrong. The consequence of which was that no one dared to offer such third petition, and grievances seldom falling under the notice of the sovereign, he had little opportunity to redress them. The restrictions, for some there are, which are laid upon petitioning in England, are of a nature extremely different, and while they promote the spirit of peace, they are no check upon that of liberty. Care only must be taken, lest, under the pretense of petitioning, the subject be guilty of any riot or tumult, as happened in the opening of the memorable Parliament in 1640, and, to prevent this, it is provided by the Statute 13 Charles II, Statute 1, Chapter 5, that no petition to the King, or either House of Parliament, for any alterations in church or state shall be signed by above twenty persons, unless the matter thereof be approved by three justices of the peace, or the major part of the grand jury in the country, and in London by the Lord Mayor, Aldermen, and Common Council. Nor shall any petition be presented by more than two persons at a time. But under these regulations it is declared by the Statute 1 William and Mary, Statute 2, Chapter 2, that the subject hath the right to petition and that all commitments and persecutions for such petitioning are illegal. 5. The fifth and last auxiliary right of the subject that I shall at present mention is that of having arms for their defence, suitable to their condition and degree, and such as are allowed by law, which is also declared by the same statute 1 William and Mary, Statute 2, Chapter 2, and is indeed a public allowance, under due restrictions, of the natural right of resistance and self-preservation, when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression. In these several articles consist the rights, or as they are frequently termed, the liberties of Englishmen, liberties more generally talked of than thoroughly understood, 
and yet highly necessary to be perfectly known and considered by every man of rank or property, lest his ignorance of the points whereon it is founded should hurry him into faction or licentiousness on the one hand, or a pusillanimous indifference and criminal submission on the other. And we have seen that these rights consist primarily in the free enjoyment of personal security, of personal liberty, and of private property. So long as these remain inviolate, the subject is perfectly free, for every species of compulsive tyranny and oppression must act in opposition to one or other of these rights, having no other object upon which it can possibly be employed. To preserve these from violation, it is necessary that the constitution of parliaments be supported in its full vigour, and limits certainly known be set to the royal prerogative. And, lastly, to vindicate these rights, when actually violated or attacked, the subjects of England are entitled, in the first place, to the regular administration and free course of justice in the courts of law, next to the right of petitioning the King and Parliament for a redress of grievances, and lastly to the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defence. And all these rights and liberties it is our birthright to enjoy entire unless where the laws of our country have laid them under necessary restraints. Restraints in themselves so gentle and moderate as will appear upon farther inquiry that no man of sense or property would wish to see them slackened, for all of us have it in our choice to do everything that a good man would desire to do, and are restrained from nothing but what would be pernicious either to ourselves or our fellow-citizens so that this review of our situation may fully justify the observation of a learned French author, who indeed generally both thought and wrote in the spirit of genuine freedom, and who hath not scrupled to profess, even in the very bosom of his native country, that the English is the only nation in the world where political or civil liberty is the direct end of its constitution. Recommending therefore to the student in our laws, a farther and more accurate search into this extensive and important title, I shall close my remarks upon it with the expiring wish of the famous father Paul to his country. Esto perpetua. End of Part 2 of Chapter 1 Of the Absolute Rights of Individuals Section 15 Part 1 of Chapter 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J.C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 1. Chapter the Second of the Parliament. We are next to treat of the rights and duties of persons as they are members of society and stand in various relations to each other. These relations are either public or private, and we will first consider those that are public. The most universal public relation by which men are connected together is that of government, namely, as governors and governed, or, in other words, as magistrates and people. Of magistrates also some are supreme, in whom the sovereign power of the state resides. Others are subordinate, deriving all their authority from the supreme magistrate, accountable to him for their conduct, and acting in an inferior secondary sphere. In all tyrannical governments, the supreme magistracy, or the right both of making and of enforcing the laws, is vested in one and the same man or one and the same body of man, and wherever those two powers are united together, there can be no public liberty. The magistrate may enact tyrannical laws, and execute them in a tyrannical manner, since he is possessed, in quality of dispenser of justice, with all the power which he, as legislator, thinks proper to give himself. But, where the legislative and executive authority are in distinct hands, the former will take care not to entrust the latter with so large a power as may tend to the subversion of its own independence, and therewith of the liberty of the subject. With us, therefore, in England, this supreme power 
is divided into two branches, the one legislative, to wit, the Parliament, consisting of King, Lords, and Commons, the other executive, consisting of the King alone. It will be the business of this chapter to consider the British Parliament, in which the legislative power, and, of course, the supreme and absolute authority of the State, is vested by our Constitution. The original or first institution of Parliament is one of those matters that lie so far hidden in the dark ages of antiquity that the tracing of it out is a thing equally difficult and uncertain. The word Parliament itself, or colloquium, as some of our historians translated, is comparatively of modern date, derived from the French, and signifying the place where they meet and conferred together. It was first applied to general assemblies of the states under Louis the Seventh in France, about the middle of the twelfth century. But it is certain that, long before the introduction of the Norman language into England, all matters of importance were debated and settled in the great councils of the realm, a practice which seems to have been universal among the northern nations, particularly the Germans, and carried by them into all the countries of Europe, which they overran at the dissolution of the Roman Empire, relics of which constitution, under various modifications and changes, are still to be met with in the diets of Poland, Germany, and Sweden, and the assembly of the estates in France, for what is there now called the Parliament is only the Supreme Court of Justice, composed of judges and advocates, which neither is in practice nor is supposed to be, in theory, a general council of the realm. With us in England, this general council has been held immemorially, under the several names of Michel Sinus, or Great Council, Michel Gimot, or Great Meeting, and more frequently, with Tena Gimot, or the Meeting of Wise Men. It was also styled in Latin, Commune Concilium Regni, Magdum Concilium Regis, Coria Magna, Conventus Magnatum, Vel Procerum, Assisa Generalis, and sometimes Communitas Regni Angliae. We have instances of its meeting to order the affairs of the kingdom, to make new laws, and to amend the old, or, as Vlita expresses it, quote, Novis injuriis emersis nova constituere remedia, end quote so early as the reign of Ina, king of the West Saxons, Offa, king of the Mercians, and Ethelbert, king of Kent, in the several realms of the Heptarchy. And, after their union, the mirror informs us that King Alfred ordained for a perpetual usage that these councils should meet twice in the year, or oftener, if need be, to treat of the government of God's people, how they should keep themselves from sin, should live in quiet, and should receive right. Our succeeding Saxon and Danish monarchs held frequent councils of this sort, as appears from their respective codes of laws. The titles whereof usually speak them to be enacted, either by the king, with the advice of his witina gemote, or wise men, as, quote, Haec sunt instituta, quae Edgarus rex concilio sapientum suorum instituit. End quote, or to be enacted by those sages with the advice of the king, as, quote, Haec sunt judicia, quae sapientes concilio regis et elstani instituerunt, End quote. or lastly, to be enacted by them both together, as, quote, Ai sunt institutiones, quas rex et mundus, et episcopi, sui cum sapientibus, Suis instituerunt. End quote. There is also no doubt but these great councils were held regularly under the first princes of the Norman line. Glanville, who wrote in the reign of Henry the Second, speaking of the particular amount of an immersement in the sheriff's court, says, It had never yet been ascertained by the general assize or assembly, but was left to the custom of particular counties. Here, the general assize is spoken of as a meeting well known, 
and its statutes or decisions are put in a manifest contradistinction to customs, or the common law. And in Edward the Third's time, an act of Parliament, made in the reign of William the Conqueror, was pleaded in the case of the Abbey of St. Edmundsbury, and judicially allowed by the court. Hence, it indisputably appears that parliaments, or general councils, are coeval with the kingdom itself. How those parliaments were constituted and composed is another question, which has been matter of great dispute among our learned antiquarians, and particularly whether the commons were summoned at all, or, if summoned, at what period they began to form a distinct assembly. But it is not my intention here to enter into controversies of this sort. I hold it sufficient that it is generally agreed that, in the main, the constitution of Parliament, as it now stands, was marked out so long ago as the seventeenth year of King John, A.D. 1215, in the great charter granted by that prince, wherein he promises to summon all archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons, personally, and all other tenants-in-chief under the crown, by the sheriff and bailiffs, to meet at a certain place, with forty days' notice, to assess aids and scrutages when necessary. And this constitution has subsisted, in fact, at least from the year 1266, 49 Henry the Third, there being still extant writs of that date, to summon knights, citizens, and burgesses to Parliament. I proceed, therefore, to inquire wherein consists this constitution of Parliament, as it now stands, and has stood for the space of five hundred years. And in the prosecution of this inquiry, I shall consider, first, the manner and time of its assembling, secondly, its constituent parts, thirdly, the laws and customs relating to Parliament, considered as one aggregate body, fourthly and fifthly, the laws and customs relating to each house, separately and distinctly taken, sixthly, the methods of proceeding, and of making statutes in both houses, and lastly, the manner of the Parliament's adjournment, prorogation, and dissolution. 1. As to the manner and time of assembling. The Parliament is regularly to be summoned by the King's writ or letter, issued out of chancery by advice of the Privy Council, at least forty days before it begins to sit. It is a branch of the royal prerogative that no Parliament can be convened by its own authority, or by the authority of any, except the King alone. And this prerogative is founded upon very good reason. For, supposing it had a right to meet spontaneously, without being called together, it is impossible to conceive that all the members, and each of the houses, would agree unanimously upon the proper time and place of meeting. And if half of the members met, and half absented themselves, who shall determine which is really the legislative body, the part assembled, or that which stays away? It is therefore necessary that the Parliament should be called together at a determinate time and place, and highly becoming its dignity and independence, that it should be called together by none but one of its own constituent parts. And, of the three constituent parts, this office can only appertain to the King, as he is a single person, whose will may be uniform and steady, the first person in the nation being superior to both houses in dignity, and the only branch of the legislature that has a separate existence, and is capable of performing any act at a time when no Parliament is in being. Nor is it an exception to this rule that, by some modern statutes, on the demise of a king or queen, if there be then no Parliament in being, the last Parliament revives, and is to sit again for six months, unless dissolved by the successor. For this revived Parliament must have been originally summoned by the Crown. It is true that, by a statute, 16 Charles I, Chapter 1, it was enacted that if the King neglected to call a Parliament for three years, 
the peers might assemble and issue out writs for the choosing one, and, in case of neglect of the peers, the constituents might meet and elect one themselves. But this, if ever put in practice, would have been liable to all the inconveniences I have just now stated, and the act itself was esteemed so highly detrimental and injurious to the royal prerogative that it was repealed by statutes 16 Charles II, Chapter 1. From thence, therefore, no precedent can be drawn. It is also true that the Convention Parliament, which restored King Charles the Second, met above a month before his return, the Lords by their own authority, and the Commons in pursuance of writs issued in the name of the Keepers of the Liberty of England by authority of Parliament, and that the said Parliament sat till the twenty-ninth of December, full seven months after the Restoration, and enacted many laws, several of which are still in force, but this was for the necessity of the thing, which supersedes all law, for if they had not so met, it was morally impossible that the kingdom should have been settled in peace, and the first thing done after the king's return was to pass an act declaring this to be a good parliament, notwithstanding the defect of the king's writ, so that, as the royal prerogative was chiefly wounded by their so meeting, and as the king himself, who alone had a right to object, consented to waive the objection. This cannot be drawn into an example in prejudice of the rights of the crown. Besides, we should also remember that it was at that time a great doubt among the lawyers whether even this healing act made it a good parliament, and held by very many in the negative, though it seems to have been too nice a scruple. It is likewise true that at the time of the Revolution, A.D. 1688, the Lords and Commons, by their own authority, and upon the summons of the Prince of Orange, afterwards King William, met in a convention, and therein disposed of the crown and kingdom. But it must be remembered that this assembling was upon a like principle of necessity as at the Restoration, that is, upon an apprehension that King James the Second had abdicated the government, and that the throne was thereby vacant, which apprehension of theirs was confirmed by their concurrent resolution, when they actually came together. And in such a case as the palpable vacancy of a throne, it follows ex necessitate rei that the form of the royal writs must be laid aside, otherwise no parliament can ever meet again. For let us put another possible case, and suppose, for the sake of argument, that the whole royal line should at any time fail and become extinct, which would indisputably vacate the throne. In this situation, it seems reasonable to presume that the body of the nation, consisting of lords and commons, would have a right to meet and settle the government. Otherwise, there must be no government at all. And upon this, and no other principle, did the convention in 1688 assemble. The vacancy of the throne was precedent to their meeting, without any royal summons, not a consequence of it. They did not assemble without writ, and then make the throne vacant, but the throne being previously vacant by the king's abdication, they assembled without writ, as they must do if they assembled at all. Had the throne been full, their meeting would not have been regular, but as it was really empty, such meeting became absolutely necessary, and accordingly it is declared by Statute 1, William and Mary, Statute 1, Chapter 1, that this convention was really the two houses of Parliament, notwithstanding the want of writs or other defects of form. So that, notwithstanding these two capital exceptions, which were justifiable only on a principle of necessity, and each of which, by the way, induced a revolution in the government, the rule laid down is in general certain, that the king only can convoke a parliament. And this, by the ancient statutes of the realm, he is bound to do every year, or oftener, if need be. Not that he is, or ever was, obliged by these statutes to call a new parliament every year, but only to permit a parliament to sit annually 
for the redress of grievances and dispatch of business, if need be. These last words are so loose and vague that such of our monarchs as were inclined to govern without parliaments neglected the convoking of them, sometimes for a very considerable period, under pretense that there was no need of them. But, to remedy this, by the statute 16, Charles the Second, Chapter 1, it is enacted that the sitting and holding of parliaments shall not be intermitted above three years at the most. And by the statute 1, William and Mary, Statute 2, Chapter 2, it is declared to be one of the rights of the people, that for redress of all grievances, and for the amending, strengthening, and preserving the laws, parliaments ought to be held frequently. And this indefinite frequency is again reduced to a certainty by Statute 6, William and Mary, Chapter 2, which enacts, as the statute of Charles II had done before,